most important information of, of the morning, the pass password for the lowly network is uh, UNB at lowly 2023. If when you connect, it may take a little while to get, but it works. We are running a little bit behind of schedule, so let's uh, rush for the opening ceremony or very quick opening ceremony. I, I welcome everyone for for this this meeting. Please, please uh, come down here. <laughs> please come here. We are we are starting. So we don't run late. We have a long schedule for three days event. So in order to uh, open uh, the lowly meeting, I would like to invite here uh, Joyce Sadka to, to join us, representing lowly, <laughs> or lowly. <laughs> Amanda Oliveira, representing JED, and the organizing committee of LOLI. Jose Marcio Camargo, who is the dean of the School of Economics and Administration in Accounting. And our Dean of Graduate Studies, Lucio Renault. So now that we are all here, I would like to thank everyone, uh, our foreign presenters, our Brazilian presenters, those who are here just to attend meetings, and our sponsors in one of our main sponsors uh, is just here, Jose Luis Pagnesat, who is here on behalf of Corecon there. And we are being able to stream the entire event thanks to his support, thanks to the Corecon support. So, uh, but we also had to, the support of other institutions. You can see them here. We had the support of uh, Selma University, Unieuro is a group, a private group of universities who uh, are supporting this event. Hopefully, they will from the oh, uh, do it in, instead of us <laughs> for for more variety. Uh, we also had the support of the CEAG, the Center of Studies of Governments of the University of Brasilia, uh, and of course. We had uh, great support from uh, our, our uh, school and our Department of Economics and the Graduate Program of Economics. So I, I am very grateful to all our supporters. And I will ask uh, each one here uh, on the table to say a few words so we can uh, proceed to the academic part of the event. I will start with Amanda. Could you please say a few words? Good morning. It's an honor for me to be here today. I'm a witness uh, to uh, Professor Bugarin's huge effort to make this the best event ever. And I'm really happy to be a part of it. Um, I hope we have days of knowledge and friendship together. So 
I uh, wish you all a great event. And thank you, Professor Bugarin, for this invitation. And thank you for this huge effort. I, I also forgot to acknowledge that in addition to Loli, this we have three meetings going on in one, and is the meeting of the Economics and Politics Research Group and the, the meeting of the Group of Studies in law and economics of the uh, well of the University of Brasilia and IDP. <laughs> thank you. Thank all the institutions for their support. Now I would like to ask Joyce to say a few words. Well, I want to say that it's uh, it's an honor to to be here, and not only in Brasilia at University of Brasilia, but also sitting right here and representing uh, our Laule group. Uh, next year, it'll be 10 years that we have been meeting. Uh, and uh, it has always been uh, um, a very interesting mix of law, economics, many times business, um, political science. We've had also quite a bit of, of political science. And uh, also, it's been a good way to keep in contact with a, um, research agendas that we revisit on a uh, on an ongoing basis in in different years, but also seeing new people each time. And so uh, it's been great to be part of this workshop. Uh, and we now have five universities that are involved. So uh, it will take quite a while to go around uh, the hosts. And I hope that this year will be just like all the other years, uh, very fruitful um, in, in the academic sense, but also in making connections uh, and networks in these areas. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Professor Zemarcio, from the, uh, the School of Economics, Accounting and Business. Welcome to the University of Brasilia. It's a pleasure to receive you here. This faculty, the Faculty of Economics, Administration, Accountancy, and Public Policies Management is a very active in terms of research. Uh, it's one of the most active faculties in developing projects, projects for government agency. And especially the economics is leading a long time in development of research in development of um, new services for the academic community of Brazil, but also the different bodies of Brazilian government. So uh, it's a pleasure to receive you all here. And I would say thank you especially to Dr. Mauricio Bulgarin, which is leading uh, the faculty in organizing high level uh conference and meetings uh we are very proud of of this uh this conference and i hope that you enjoy your time here in brasilia and also in in our faculty thank you very much now i will ask professor lucio renal who, who is our dean of graduate study to say a few words and declare the beginning of this three-day journey Thank you so much, uh, Mauricio. It's a pleasure to be here. Welcome to Brasilia. Uh, welcome to the University of Brasilia. Uh, I hope you have a good time during the conference. I hope you learn and uh, make new friendships and partnerships and networks that can last longer uh, than this event. Uh, and I hope you have a fruitful time also in, in presenting your papers and getting ideas for your papers and, and so on and so forth. So very happy to be here. I'd like to congratulate Professor Modis Bugarin for leading the organization of this very important event for the University of Brasilia. We have um, tried to invest as much as we can in internationalizing our university in promoting events like this is very is a very important step in that direction. So I hope this is uh, the beginning or the continuation of a long lasting relationship. Uh, between you and the University of Brazil, and I hope to see you back here many other times in the in the near future. 
um, I, I am, again, should I declare it initiated? Is that right? Wow, that's a big honor. Um, I haven't done that yet before. So, so I, I declared open. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's important to say as well that uh, the, the rector, right, of our university, Professor Marcia Abraão, could not be here today. So I also have the honor of representing her on this event. Uh, unfortunately, she had other other uh, events to attend to. Uh, so on behalf of, is that how it should be? On behalf of the president of the University of Brasilia, I declare to open uh, this meeting. Thank you so much, Maurice. Thank you all so much. I was so much concerned about not going behind schedule that were ahead schedule. That's good. <laughs> so thank you. I, I'm, we are going to invite Adriana Portugal, who is going to lead the first academic session of this conference, and it's a very special one. So please come. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, we will start session two. Special panel of the Brazilian team. Express my gratitude to Professor. Be here. Very important to me because uh, I'm a civil engineer. I, I work at Federal District Auditing Board, and I dedicated my career over there trying to combine engineering and economics. I will have this opportunity and find myself with the company of Marcelo Brandão. I invite to come. Bruno Brandão, sorry. Yes. <laughs> sorry. I, I merged the names. Marcelo Brandão. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now I, I invite to, I invite Marcelo Ribeiro. So we are going to see corruption as, a, as an economic aspect that directs and strongly affects infrastructure in Brazil. I will read their revenue. After that, we will start our holds a PhD in law from the University of Lisbon with postdoctoral uh, in studies at the University of Lisbon with postdoctoral studies at the University of Salamanca. He earned his master's and bachelor's degree from the University of Brasilia. Marcelo has a rich background as a former federal prosecutor in Brazil, dedicating 16 years to various cases. He served as a member of the Permanent Advisor Committee on Leninism and Collaboration and as a Deputy Head of the International Cooperation Unit. 
He is a professor in anatomy with this with his latest publication focusing on transnational use of evidence provided by collaborators in non trial resolution. Bruno Brandão, he, he serves at Director at Transparency International Brazil. And he is an economist from the University of Minas Gerais here in Brazil, holding a master's in public management from the University of York, United, United Kingdom, and in international relations from the Barcelona Institute of International Studies. His extensive experience with Transparency International spans over 10 years, including roles in organizations, secretary, secretariat in German, and coordination of the climate financing Inter integrity program in Mexico. Since 2016, he has been the executive director of the organization's Brazilian chapter. He is also a fellow of Open Government in the Americas program of organization. So he is also, he is also a fellow of the Open, Open Government in the Americas program of the organizations of American states and the Transformation Thinkers Program of the Betterman Foundation. In recognition of his leadership in establishing Transparency International in Brazil, he received the Amalia Award in Berlin in 2017. Uh, Marcelo will use 30 minutes for his presentation, and then Bruno will present using the same time, and after that, we will have 20 minutes for discussion. Hey everyone, uh, good morning all. Honor to be here. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the organization and uh, the uh, an honor to return to ND, uh, as mentioned, my, my alma mater. I'd like to discuss a little bit about the 10 years of the Team Companies Act. Uh, one point really important to, to, to discuss about it is uh, about the effects of this legislation, but I, I'd like to start uh, with the why we had to pass this this bill in the Congress and what's the importance of the, the Clean Companies Act. First of all, it was a pressure uh, 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 from uh, uh, another another uh, another countries. Uh, the, the, the Clean Companies Act came in 2013 and it was enforced in 2014. At the same time that Brazil was being uh, evaluated uh, uh, by OECD uh, regarding the implementation of the uh, foreign bribery uh, convention. And Brazil was in default uh, regarding how to punish companies that uh, well may commit the foreign bribery. Uh, it was uh, the, the, the most common uh, uh, mention, historic mention, and uh, one other question would be uh, why uh, OECD would demand this to, to the whole countries and especially uh, regarding Brazil. Uh, the main point is uh, the idea of, uh, uh, of having a, a common background, a common regulation among the countries, uh, making sure uh, we have uh, uh, the same uh, competitivity uh, regulation in those countries. In other terms, if you have a, a dirt environment, it's hard to make business. And uh, of course, this, this country may have uh, advantages uh, uh, comparing to another. This is what, uh, the most common background when we comment how and why uh, the Clean Companies uh, Act uh, appeared. But there is another point in regarding the enforcement of the, 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 this legislation I would like to, to comment. And, and, and it, I think it creates a, 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 a broader link with the law aspect of our workshop. 
it's that uh, this uh, legislation appeared at the same time uh, uh, with an amendment in the Criminal Organizations Act in Brazil. And you could ask me, what's the importance of having this uh, Criminal Organizations Act? Legislation, it started to have um, more sophisticated and more advanced uh, techniques of uh, investigation. And one of these, best, uh, these techniques was very used at that time, was a kind of non-trial resolution based on individuals uh, that we call in Brazil. And uh, this uh, the expression makes uh, uh, some, some people feel uncomfortable with that, but I have to mention a collaboração premiada. It was a, 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 a collaboration agreement for, for, non, uh, for non Brazilians, a collaboration agreement when a defendant presents evidence and testifies before the court against another uh, people involved. And it launched at 2014, 2015, uh, a very non investigation in Brazil. And uh, when the individuals were investigated, they pointed out to uh, many companies. So you have the, the individual liability and you, in, you, in, you started to have the, the corporate liability. It was the, the, the very uh, uh, important step we, we, we had at that time. And it, uh, uh, it's important because when we compare, uh, and we had uh, very recently uh, the phase four evaluation of Brazil of implementation of anti-bribery convention uh, of OECD, it started when we were we were at the phase three of the evaluation of OECD, and now we're uh, about to, to to end the phase four in Brazil. Uh, the detection of foreign bribery in Brazil it's based on a self report, essentially, and criminal investigations. Criminal investigations are addressed to individuals. So those very first cases were implemented based on this uh, uh, Criminal Organizations Act. That's, uh, that's why I make this, this link and I consider it really important to, to, to address the, the, this importance. And uh, as I mentioned a little, a little bit further, uh, it is important also because it creates attention how to deal with the liability of the individuals and the liability of the corporation. You do you have to split them. Do you have to consider it as one, and uh, it's uh, it's tricky to to consider. And uh, people of economics will hate this, but uh, it's very common in law to say that it depends on the case. Uh, we don't have a proper answer in in, in the, um, One uh, uh, lesson learned that I would like to, to start so would be this 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 uh, aspect of uh, our personal liability. When we are talking about non trial resolutions, this is my 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 my, my core uh, uh, aspect of the presentation. We have in Brazil two different scenarios. We have the, the that I mentioned, collaboração premiada, addressed to individuals, and we have the leniency agreement addressed to uh, to the companies. And it just uh, uh, was very developed on on, uh, on this uh, Clean Companies Act. One important point: uh, the evidence we obtain through these non-trial resolutions. It belongs to whom? It belongs to individual. It belongs to the company. Can we have? Uh, uh, can you talk about ownership of the evidence? It would be accurate to say that. Uh, those questions are still under uh, answering. We don't have a proper answer of that. And this is one uh, uh, challenge we have regarding uh, how to, to enhance uh, our Clean Companies Act. Uh, many times we, we uh, stay uh, very close to, uh, to, the, to the individual and it generates some problems regarding uh, how to expose the company or if his speech is aligned with the company and the company is being protected by this individual, uh, there are many aspects and how to uh, how to how to manage uh, um, 
uh, uh, this uh, uh, this independence regarding the, the the collaborator and regarding the 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 company involved. But when we mention this, you can say, "Well, but uh, but it can be re really uh, uh, solved solved in a, in, a, in a speedy way by the prosecutor." It it uh, presents us another problem. It's regarding which agency or which uh, uh, branch of the state would be responsible to uh, uh, carry on with this case. See, I mentioned in the very first that we are related to criminal cases and criminal cases in Brazil are solely conducted by the prosecution service. Regarding the, the Clean Companies Act, we are talking about administrative liability. Our legislator could choose civil liability, criminal liability. We don't we don't have a, a broad criminal liability of legal persons in Brazil. We only have for environmental purposes. So uh, the decision was to present administrative sanctions. And in a federal level, it's held by the CGU, the uh, the Comptroller's General Office. In other terms. You have the MPF in the federal level or, or the persecution service in, as a whole for the criminal side and under security level, uh, CGU. We had struggle with that because we have two agencies, well, in the, at first competing to see who would be the, 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 the responsible uh, for, for coordinating the efforts against corruption. And we have the experience that uh, we had the, the Federal Prosecution Service conducted some uh, of those uh, non-trial resolutions, but the leniency agreement, and it was uh, uh, challenged in the judiciary. And uh, the final ruling, or the final ruling so far, would be that the agencies uh, should avoid competing and try to coordinate the efforts. We are in this very in this very specific moment. We advanced since the, 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 the start of enforcement of the Clean Companies Act 2014. And now we uh, we are facing this, this uh, coordination issue. Uh, I, I, I wrote an article regarding this and I, and I said that CGU and the MPF at first were were in a Highlander syndrome. I don't know if you remember though, this very old movie that uh, the, the the statement would be that there can be only one, uh, and the idea is that it's completely inaccurate. In in, in the end of the day, we have to uh, pick uh, some 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 good practices you have in both agencies and try to develop uh, coordinated before it. And we had. An experience trying to coordinate this, but uh, and it was coordinated by the judiciary system that could be uh, completely out of the scope of the duties of the judiciary and completely uh, well, it, it doesn't depend on the judiciary. That's why it's called a non-trial resolution. And uh, the prosecution service didn't accept this protocol because at the end of the day, uh, it would, uh, in practical terms, it would remove the duties and the responsibilities of the prosecution service, and it would create more problem than not, because the, the evidentiary problem would be, would be capped, because there, were, there would be no, no, no concrete link regarding the criminal cases that I mentioned that would be so important in the, in the corporate cases and how to, to exchange the evidence and uh, which guarantees would be done to the, those individuals that are provided spontaneously this evidence. In other terms, if you provide to agencies uh, the evidence, you'll obtain uh, an agreement to not use this evidence against the person. How it would be addressed to the other agencies? Be accepted with no challenging, or they could accept for a, for a time frame and to settle with these agencies. It, this, this problem of coordination uh, is still going. Uh, we don't have nowadays uh, high profile cases to, to challenge these or to, to express this argument. Um, I hope the, the agencies that investigate uh, uh, and tackle corruption, uh, well, regain power 
and we can can pass it can pass this uh, uh, this uh, these statements and how this coordination is being addressed. And uh, besides the, the the coordination inside Brazil, we also uh, have some challenges regarding the exchange of evidence abroad. When you take in consideration uh, the case that we had in Brazil, the Dava Jato case we had in Brazil, uh, many jurisdictions were involved on this. And we also had uh, many requests to exchange this information in, uh, uh, from, from those countries. And I had the, the, the unpleasant part sometimes to refuse to cooperate. This was the, 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 the head of the International Cooperation Affairs at the NPF at the time. And many of those, those requests uh, were to obtain evidence provided by uh, companies based on the Clean Companies Act that they provided the evidence or in this co uh, collaboration and in this cooperation agreements. And many of those uh, contracts or those agreements mentioned that the evidence could be not uh, uh, exchanged or can be sent to another jurisdiction unless this jurisdiction uh, provides the same guarantees to the individuals that uh, provided this evidence. And why it, 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 uh, it's, uh, why it was demanded? See, when you sign one agreement, you give a waiver of uh, non-incrimination. Uh, you, you waive to uh, self-incriminate yourself. You confess many crimes, you provide many evidence regarding your, uh, regarding your wrongdoings. That's the, the general idea of a collaboration agreement or a non trial resolution. That's the, 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 the importance. But uh, when you make a waiver of uh, uh, self-incrimination, uh, and it's a common ground in all courts of human rights, and it can, of course, be applied to companies and especially to individuals. Uh, all those those uh, uh, courts, especially in the European courts of human rights, uh, all those courts state that
the agreements are tricky in Brazil. There is a symmetry of information that we are not able so far to reduce. Sometimes we are in the hands of the collaborator. We don't know exactly what happened. If you take, for example, the, the most known, known case here in Brazil regarding this leniency agreement or non-trial resolution, uh, I think it's the, the Odebrecht case. Uh, how to manage uh, uh, money laundering, for example, if you don't know the name of the individuals that are with nicknames in a list and you completely depend on uh, the another part to uh, to provide this uh, uh, this alias. Who would be the that the, uh, there was a guy in the list that was called the the, uh, the ugly guy and was pissed off when it was the, uh, uncovered. I don't know why, but uh, uh, this one uh, important part. In in that case, I think uh, uh, the, the relation is correct. I, he was a, an ugly guy, but uh, sometimes. It's, it's complicated to uh, address with uh, some very specific uh, uh, attribute for for the state that the guy came from, or some uh, uh, relation to to. There was a guy that had a name of a drink, and his name in the list was alcoholic. See, uh, uh, there are other uh, individuals that could have this uh, uh, this uh, uh, attribute too. So, uh, how to? Uh, uh, to move on regarding that. Uh, this relation uh, about the content of the, the agreements, uh, uh, for me, is still one of the, the greatest ch challenges you have. And for the perspective to, to the collaborator, to not being uh, acting just like a former prosecutor here, uh, the collaborator should have clear, clear uh, incentives to give the full disclosure to have the benefits of making this non trial resolution. Uh, when you see the Clean Companies Act and you see the efforts of the CGU trying to implement the, the Clean Companies Act and the regulation that came before, some bylaws that came before, uh, there are no clear indications and how, how much uh, your collaboration will be appreciated for the law enforcement. In other terms, uh, why, why don't I should suggest to, to a company to wait for the time bar, to wait for the statute of limitations. Will the government detect this or not? See, but if I can disclose this right now, it won't, uh, this shadow will be removed over my head and I, I think we can, I, we can move on. There is no clear incentivation to, to make this. And I think this is important. Uh, uh, Maybe uh, uh, the full forgiveness will be too much, but you have to have a great incentivization to, to uh, 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 well, to move on with the self-disclosure. That is, that is is still nowadays, even with this challenge, the most uh, uh, effective way to detect and to prosecute the foreign, the foreign bribery and, and, and the local bribery in general. Jana, this would be my, my first considerations. And my idea was not to make a lecture, but to, to discuss with you. Uh, so I anticipate a little bit and trying to, to give the floor opportunity to discuss in depth later. Thank you so much. Uh, before I, I... Words about his presentation, I would like to. Some, some ideas about this as, as much these cases. Uh, since I am an auditor from an audit court, and it's uh, here in Brazil, audit courts are, are the ad administrative courts that try to estimate the overpricing from this from this public works. And uh, since we have too much time <laughs> in trying to estimate this, I think we use this information more often, not only in the federal 
level, but uh, in state level, for example, here in Brazil, we have uh, an overpricing estimated in 400 million of reais. I don't know if, if in, in prices of 2010, and uh, the the public work was uh, 1 billion and 100 million of reais. And uh, because of the, our estimation, uh, the federal policy took our, our work and in, initiated the, the, the trial. Yeah, so I think this would be more and more for, for minimizing the asymmetric estimation. But let's start with Bruno. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation. It's a true pleasure to be here. Uh, as Adriana uh, mentioned in my presentation, I'm an econ economist uh, by formation, although I have been working with anti-corruption issues for over 20 years now, uh, using a lot of uh, law and political science, uh, public administration, but my mindset is still one of an economist, which I, I believe uh, gives us uh, good tools for uh, interpretation. So it's a true pleasure to be in a seminary here at the Faculty of Economics. Um, I just uh, want to very briefly uh, present the institution I, I represent here today. Can you please uh, pass? So, uh, well, before this uh, introduction, I thought in using my time here uh, with two contents. Uh, one is a recent uh, survey that we ran here in uh, Brazil to assess the perception of professional, of compliance professional regarding the 10 years of the Brazilian Clean Company Act or anti-corruption uh, law. And also, uh, if we have time, I also uh, included a brief review of what Transparency International assesses as positive and negative developments in the fight against corruption in Brazil in this year or uh, the first year of uh, the new administration, the federal administration. But uh, as I mentioned this uh, brief introduction, uh, for those who are not familiar with the institution I represent here today, um, Transparency International is the world's largest uh, anti-corruption movement uh, today. Uh, it covers over 100 countries and territories and has three decades of work uh, fighting corruption in a non-partisan and systemic, with a systemic focus. And we, are, we have been operating in Brazil since uh, 2016. So this is the results of the, the, the survey that I, that I mentioned. Uh, we wanted to listen to the professionals that work day to day in the topic of anti-corruption within the companies. So we ran together with the Research Institute Quest. We ran this uh, survey with 100 compliance officers working in Brazil's 250 largest companies, uh, according to this rank by the, the business newspaper Valor Econômico. And the survey was uh, 
performed between the 12th and the 28th of July this year. And uh, the profile of the interviews shows that this was a very senior level uh, group. So um, most were directors or head of uh, divisions, managers, senior managers, uh, superintendents, specialists and auditors and analysts were the minority, but basically the the head and the, the lead figures in the compliance department of these companies or at the C-level of this company. So beginning by an overall uh, a general question, there was a very high level of uh, almost consensus support for the law 10 years after uh, almost 100%, 95% believe that the, the, the law was uh, a positive uh, development for the country. Regarding some specific aspects of the, the law and its uh, impacts, uh, the assessment of the, the, the compliance officers show also uh, a lot of support for these uh, statements. So they think that it, it did contribute, a large almost consensus that it did contribute to, uh, to the dissemination of the integrity systems in companies also to the expansion of the culture of compliance at, at society at large. Uh, it also is perceived as attractive to, to high quality foreign investment. It helps to attract instead of uh, 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 scaring uh, investments. On the contrary, it helps to attract high quality foreign investments. It also encourages the training of specialized professionals. We didn't have such a workforce uh, with the tools, the necessary tools to, to uh, work with compliance within these companies. And now we have this uh, specialization. It's also seen as a competitive advantage for the Brazilian economy for 80% of the, 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 the interviewees. Uh, but this point here perhaps needs uh, attention here. Uh, it's not so as high as the other uh, statements. Uh, the perception that the company does impose clear and fair sanctions in cases of non-compliance. That's a disputed point, a more disputed point. So there are some doubts on the capacity today of the law to actually uh, impose sanctions. Uh, it... A, a vast majority doesn't agree that it in increases the cost of doing business in Brazil. So it's not perceived as something of a uh, part of the, the Brazil cost. It's actually on the, on the contrary. And also, uh, as mentioned before, it doesn't, is, it is not perceived as discouraging foreign investors, or quite the contrary. So overall, uh, a very po positive as, uh, assessment in many aspects of the law, except for these doubts of the enforcement of the law itself nowadays. So on the negative aspects, uh, Marcelo mentioned here some of these challenges and they are somehow re reflected uh, here, particularly the, the, the last ones, but uh, incentives, for companies to adopt integrity practice are seen as one of the points that needs uh, improvement. Uh, the professionals doesn't see enough incentive uh, by the law, by the, the, the regulatory agencies to actually incentivize the, the adoption of integrity systems. Also, the lack of detailed guidelines, what is a proper integrity program? So there is a, a, although CGU, the Controller General Office, has made some efforts in this direction, there's still uh, a sense of a lack of, of guidelines. Also, uh, the calculation method, the methodology to calculate or the dosimetry of penalties and benefits, uh, there is a perception that there is a lot of uncertainty on how this is uh, cal calculated and perhaps 
one of the reasons what Marcelo mentioned, how you calculate the damage itself, it's a, it's a, ch a challenge in itself. Uh, but there is a perception that uh, there is a lot of legal uncertainty in regarding how much you can get uh, of penalty and benefits when you enter in, in collaboration. So the leniency uh, framework in, in itself uh, is something that needs uh, improvement. And what, uh, again, Marcelo already mentioned, the lack of a centralized uh, body that uh, host, hosts the negotiations of uh, collaboration. So, so the multiple agencies uh, coordination problem is also mentioned here by the compl compliance officers. And here, uh, there's also another limitation by the law is its in impact by in small and medium-sized uh, companies. So uh, the impact that was perceived by in large companies is not uh, replicated here in this uh, dimension, companies, these small and medium-sized companies. So uh, over 50% of the interviewees doesn't think that they, there was so much impact already in small and medium-sized uh, companies. And that's... Uh, that's a big issue if you think that one of the features of this law is that uh, it gives the liability for the companies for its supply chain. So a company can be uh, liable for wrongdoings in its supply chain. So smaller companies in its supply chain that hasn't been yet impacted by this law can raise the liabilities of the, the larger companies. So that, that's a, a big challenge. Another important uh, aspect, uh, the, the question is that if in the last five years there was more investment in compliance or less, apparently this is a positive uh, result that 82% says that there was more, but we are focusing here on this 18% that are seeing disinvestment in compliance. And that's the issue that we want to to. Uh, discuss a little more uh, further in the, the presentation. So this is another very uh, challenging point that uh, compliance officers doesn't feel that uh, integrity systems are mature today in companies. They are not really able to shape behavior yet. So uh, mature, uh, only a small min minority, less than 10% believe that these integrity systems, these compliance programs are mature and can effectively shape behavior. Uh, most, a large majority think that they are immature and sometimes, only sometimes they are able to shape behavior. That uh, shows that we gave a very important uh, first step to disseminate integrity, culture, and systems in the Brazilian market, but we still fall, fall short uh, quite uh, significantly to actually uh, make these programs shape behavior. This is also uh, a challenging point. Uh, compliance Professionals are professionals under threat, constant threat, because they have to uh, face, they have to uh, make reports of wrongdoings, they have to, to deal with very sensitive issues within the companies, and therefore they need security, they need support from the, the, the leadership, and that's not the feeling overall. 44% um, believes that uh, they do have this autonomy, security, and support in the majority of companies, but uh, the majority of respondents believes that only in a minority of companies, uh, this autonomy, security, and support is uh, assured for compliance uh, officers. Coming to, to the conclusion here, but uh, this is more in detail what the, the compliance uh, officers believe that can be improved to make in integrity systems more mature. So training in first place, also effective 
punishment is also seen as uh, something that can drive uh, the evolution of these programs. The tone from the top, so top management uh, engagement and support, improvement of legal certainty, enforcement and government incentives, audited and oversight systems, publicizing actions taken, international pressure involvement was not so significant, market self-regulatory business pressures also not as significant as the other aspects. Regarding the experience of the large anti-corruption operations in Brazil, as we have seen in the last decade, decade how, how important it, it was for the improvement of the feeling of uh, impunity in, in the country. So for the compliance officers, the vast majority believe these anti-corruption operations were important to reduce the feeling of impunity, and uh, only a minority believe that there was no such impact. And also, aligned with the last questions, these anti-corruption operations, they did help to make, uh, to drive improvements and enhancement in integrity standards within uh, the companies, or a large majority of, of respondents. Regarding the specific operation, the car wash operation, most of all have positive impression of the operation. Neutral is also uh, significant and 11% uh, have a negative perception of the, the operation. So there is support for the operation among these professionals. This is uh, also concerning uh, regarding the enforcement of the, the anti-corruption law. Only 28% perce perceived that it increased, but almost 75% that it was stagnated, enforcement was stagnated or decreased. So this is a very important uh, result here because it shows the perception of risk is lowering in the Brazilian market uh, regarding enforcement of the anti-corruption law. We also have a challenge regarding state-owned companies, statais, and the debate on the lowering uh, or making the law less rigid, the state-owned company's law less rigid, and the market perceives it as a high risk of impacting governance and compliance among these companies if there is such reform of the law. Finally, uh, regarding the accession to the OECD, the market perceives it as something that could raise, help to raise standards uh, in the Brazilian market. And a minority, 13%, believe that uh, there would, wouldn't have such uh, impact. So to conclude, these are the key takeaways that the company, the compliance community has almost consensus support for the, the the law and they do believe that there was a dissemination of compliance systems after the law but they are also very uh frank regarding the immaturity of these uh these systems and and the the, the limitations of this uh the implementation of these systems there is a lack of support in security compliance uh, for compliance uh professionals also the lack of training and, and legal incentives uh, the law also had an effect on compliance of small and medium companies, but there are there's still low impact for these uh, these type of companies. Professionals considered that the major anti-corruption operations like Lava Jato were important for raising integrity standards in the Brazilian market, but there is a significant perception of stagnation and even reduction of enforcement in recent years. So. Uh, before I finalize, I, I wanted just to bring, uh, just for food for thought and perhaps to, to uh, for our debate, just some points that uh, we are uh, ending the year and we have, we will soon publish a review of the positive and negative aspects of the anti-corruption agenda in Brazil. And as this is the first year of the new government, I thought that could be 
also useful to to share these uh, reflections regarding these advancements and uh, challenges that we we see at the current moment. So, in terms of positive developments this year, we saw with the new government uh, technical appointments to key law enforcement positions at the Controller General Office at the federal police and other units that are again occupied by technical and credible professionals. Uh, we are witnessing the recovery of environmental governance uh, in uh, fighting environmental crime and, and corruption regarding the environment after the institutional uh, destruction that we saw in the last years. Also positive, the removal of abusive secrecy classification and the publication of adequate procedures in the enforcement of the law of access to, to information. This was made by CGU, the Controller General Office. It was very important. Also the tax reform just recently uh, approved has some very positive impact on transparency and accountability regarding tax uh, corruption and tax justice. New limits uh, for procrastination at Supreme Court trials. This was a decision by the former chair of the, the, the Supreme Court, the, the Chief Justice Rosa Weber, before she, she retired. Uh, the reestablishment of dialogue with civil society and space for civic participation have are being recovered. Also important, uh, although not perceived as directly impacted, but it does have uh, important systemic impact. Affirmative actions in the appointment to key positions in the federal administration. This has a potential to impact on institution uh, corruption. But now on the downside, uh, what we notice are the expansion and strengthening of the so-called Centrão Parliamentary Bloc, which is a block of very physiologic uh, members of, of parliament, uh, more empowered than ever, and also in, in occasions aligned with sector of the workers' parties and also the, the group uh, following former President Bolsonaro. The so-called secret budget that was an invention by the former government, uh, uh, one of the largest institutionalized corruption schemes, is not uh, over. Uh, we are seeing this practice uh, maintained in different forms by the new government. Also, setbacks in state-owned companies' compliance mechanisms, uh, particularly the pressure over the reforms on the, the law, but also uh, specific events and uh, incidents in Petrobras, which is uh, a model for the Brazilian market and can, can have uh, systemic impact. Also, the appointment of government ministers investigated for the mis misuse of public re resources convicted for embezzlement and with evidence of relations with Rio militias. These uh, ministers were maintained. Some of them are still in office cabinet. Uh, and also the persistent threats to the Brazilian Financial Integrity Unit, which is uh, the heart of our anti-money laundry uh, system, which is uh, COAF, is uh, constantly under threat. And there is a lot of legal uncertainty of its capacity to produce and disseminate Financial integrity, uh, financial intelligence reports. So, appointment of the president's personal lawyer to the federal Supreme Court uh, in a clear uh, uh, demonstration of a lack of uh, independence to the judiciary. A serial, a series of annulments of corruption convictions and re the return to a state of systemic impunity. And uh, perhaps the most important example and mo most serious uh, example is the annulment of all the Odebrecht evidence from the, the largest leniency agreement in the history, not only of Brazil, but in the world. Uh, the legal uncertainty and risks international mutual legal assistance retaliation of law enforcement agents and chilling effect. Agents are now afraid to be engaged uh, uh, in high profile cases. The uh, pressures for suspension and rene renegotiation of leniency agreements, generating more legal uncertainty for collaboration instruments. Perception of reduced enforcement and 
divestment in compliance, the persistent trend of political pol polarization and persistent challenge to return into constitutional normality. Most important here, the limitations of acts and respect to due process at the highest court in Brazil, the Su Supreme Tribunal Federal. The last slide, so some points uh, for attention in the, the current moment. The appointment of the new prosecutor general would be uh, a milestone for this uh, government in terms of anti-corruption and other aspects, and the overall respect for judicial independence. The new PAC, Programa de Aceleração do Crescimento, the new growth acceleration program with expected over 30, 350 billion in investment, new foreign investment flows from China, from Arab countries that has other standards in, in, in compliance, corruption, impunity, and climate change. So a uh, milestone will be the COP30 in, in Belém and Brazil's uh, G20. Uh, France will co-chair the anti-corruption working group with Brazil. In the recent, Marcelo mentioned also this uh, review. Marcelo worked with this uh, review processes. And this year, Brazil is being reviewed by the working group on bribery of the OECD, just recently published the review of Brazil. The Financial Action Task Force also finalized uh, just a few weeks ago the review of Brazil. And next month, we will see the conclusion of the UN Convention Against Corruption's review on, on Brazil. So these are some important points of, of attention that I wanted to, 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 to raise here. So thank you very much uh, for your time. And uh, I'll be happy to, to discuss some of these issues uh, in our debate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruno. I, I hope to, that you, you both were very punctual. <laughs> Thank you for this. And uh, I'm not sure with this, this, this discussion, but I think you should raise your hands and some um, questions. I would like to. Emphasize the, the the result that you have have mentioned about the punishment. We, uh, as a as as a, an auditor, I I think that in auditing courts we are having we are be betting too much in compliance, uh, and we are missing our opportunity of punishment. And it's not a good idea for I have we. I think we have to, to, to balance these two possibilities. So, anyone? Uh, just one uh, additional comment. Uh, we are discussing here about uh, the coordination uh, among the agencies. Uh, I mentioned uh, briefly uh, regarding CGU and MPF, regarding specifically regard, uh, uh, regarding the, the agreements. But uh, as uh, uh, I commented, uh, when we are talking about investigation, the auditors uh, uh, have an expertise and have opportunities to develop a work that should not be uh, uh, disconsidered with, uh, in, in these efforts. Uh, in the end of the day, uh, the idea uh, to remove the competition and, and move towards uh, to coordination uh, and within the, 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 the state agencies uh, uh, would be quite important. And the, the auditors uh, and also the coordination at state federal level, I think would be really important. Of course, it's complicated because you have to establish the jurisdiction in many cases, but it, of course, it, it, it does not preclude the opportunity to, to discuss. And especially in take, uh, taking advantage of, of one slide of Bruno, uh, the coordination with tax authorities and uh, financial intelligence units is crucial for, for uh, uh, good cases and for detecting co corruption. And when you have the FIU 
uh, the, the information uh, intelligence unit are, are working with dependence and with poor cap technical capacity. You also can demand uh, to the private sector better in better, uh, uh, STR, better suspicious transaction reports in order to, uh, uh, well, to, to give the, the, the tools that the FIU use to provide those reports and to de detect the, the bribery. I think it is important. And well, when we see uh, uh, Bruno's notes, we can say, uh, wrapping up the 10 years of the Clean Companies Act, that we had two different stages. We have the very first stage, in the, the, maybe the first five years, to 2018, that we had uh, uh, really a uh, uh, growing use of this. It was a new and was uh, very uh, close to the, the, the high profile cases, or high profile criminal cases that are, are ongoing. Later on, you don't see uh, the same uh, uh, will to, 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 to conduct the cases. Uh, there are political aspects indeed, but also we had the pandemics, and I think the, uh, uh, it can be considered as well. Many of those cases, uh, uh, especially in the federal level, those cases are quite old. So many of them uh, were time barred or do uh, or were time barred or faced the statute of limitations. And when you consider that the Clean Companies Act have five years as a, a time bar. I think it's a point that should be included and then you should have amendment in this legislation. Five years can be a, a very insufficient time to, to conduct a case. I think there's only one aspect also that I can comment. And uh, Bruno was very uh, happy also to, to, to mention that some dismissals that uh, the, the judiciary made in some cases, considering the evidence unlawful, uh, diminish the the, the, the the will of the, the law enforcement to conduct the case. There are, we are facing some chilling effects regarding some prosecutions and some administrative sanctions regarding prosecutors and auditors uh, in general. But also, when you see all report being considered no and void, of, uh, we cannot just consider that is also uh, uh, is, uh, this stimulates uh, uh, to, to start New, new, new words. And just not to end uh, with uh, bad news or with uh, a sad perception. Uh, yeah, as I, when I started, I mentioned that the Clean Companies Act came from a pressure for a demand of the OECD. And the OECD convention came uh, inspired on the FCPA, the Foreign Corrupt Cor Cor Practices Act from the United States. They have idea to have a, a, a well, I won't discuss the resolution, universal resolution of the United States, but uh, the idea was to have a, 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 a clean environment of business. They started on 70s and now FCPA is known worldwide. The idea is uh, Clean Companies Act has completed uh, uh, 10 years. Many things were done and it's, a good, it's good news. Many things has uh, has to be done, but in general, we made in ten years much more than they did in more than forty. I, I think we can can conclude with that. Fire optimist. <laughs> yeah, since I work uh, in estimating uh, overpricing, it's truly disappointing. Truly disappointed with this annulment. Because it's it's impossible to believe that overpricing in public work. Have to believe that it was not a corruption act. So uh, please. Uh, thank you for uh, practice for the topic.
Oh, thank you very much. This is uh, it's a great uh, question. I have been reflecting on this lately with uh, Professor Matthew Stephenson from uh, uh, Harvard Law. And um, there are these uh, debates, for those who are not uh, familiar uh, with this specific uh, question, there, there is this uh, bit between these two approaches, the Big Bang uh, approach uh, and the incremental approach. And uh, I think the recent uh, experience here in Brazil, not only Brazil, but also perhaps Guatemala, also with the CICIG, the, the, the Commission Against Corruption and Impunity of the UN that was installed in Guatemala, also was a big bang there. Uh, and so some reflections about the experience of living uh, a, a big bang that I personally uh, have and I have been debating this is that this Big Bang, it didn't come uh, from the void. It was actually the result of decades of incremental reforms. So we have seen uh, since the redemocratization of Brazil in uh, the constitution of 88, the strengthening of the prosecutor's office, the independence of the prosecutor's office, technical capacity that was developed, the specialization of uh, financial crimes. Uh, so many reforms, small reforms that were incremental that actually created the conditions, the legal, institutional, and even social conditions for such a big bang to, to happen. So it's, a, it's actually, in my perception, uh, a false dilemma in terms of choice. There's no such thing in my reflection that we choose a path. Either we follow incremental reforms or we have a, a big anti-corruption push. Because the incremental reforms, they can create the conditions for this uh, big bang to, to happen. Uh, the issue more important, I think, is how can we be prepared for the Big Bang? Because the risks involved in such an operation like Lava Jato is the complete disruption of the political system. So that can create, as it did create here, the space for outsiders, for authoritarian populist forces to actually uh, take power and hijack the anti-corruption discourse. And then, as we have seen in so many countries, the first thing they do is actually to dismantle these, these institutions and these laws. Uh, we have seen this very clear here with the Bolsonaro government. As soon as it took, it dismantled the three pillars of our checks and balance systems of our democracy, the accountability pillar the social accountability pillar was dismantled by uh, uh, the democracy on information, so uh, the setbacks on transparency of public information, the destruction, the closing of cases, the attack on investigative media and civil society. So this weakened the social accountability pillar. Uh, in terms of accountability, a scheme like the secret budget that was implemented here, it was a method to buy the support from the Congress, not to pass agenda as at least is happening now. There is a secret budget now, but to pass agenda. And times was just to shield the government for impeachment process. There was more than 140 requests sleeping in the drawer of the Speaker of the Lower House during his time. So the accountability pillar was also dismantled. Then the judicial accountability pillar, the nomination of a prosecutor general that was controlled by the, by the government, uh, nullified the capacity to hold the government legally accountable for its act, not only for corruption, for its crimes with the pandemic and the environment, 
violations of human rights and the threats to democracy. So by nominating this uh, prosecutor general that was completely controlled, he managed also to dismantle or very much weaken the politi- the Judicial Accountability Act. So the three pillars of our checks and balance system, social accountability, political accountability, and uh, judicial accountability were dismantled. Now the challenge is to rebuild. And we are seeing how difficult it is after the experience of these very low standards to actually rebuild them. So I went a bit further in in your question, but just this reflection that the incremental reforms can produce a big bang. And then I think the big uh, issue and how can we be prepared for such a, a completely disrupt not only the fight against corruption, but the democratic system uh, at large. Mm-hmm. But to tell you that uh, in audit courts, we are having a very uh, have a, a challenge because this secret budget, they are applied in public works and no one is controlling, you know, because the, it's it, it represents federal money, and uh, since this spread out, yeah, it's hard to to see or even see the, to control the 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 money. So uh, we now we have this te- challenge to coordinate our thoughts in order to to do this. Yeah, very interesting presentation. I had a a question for Bruno about the It's a it's an important methodological uh, question. The, the question was regarding market wise, so the the general perception of uh, market um, and the the res- respondents were not identified, uh, so it was anonymized. Uh, so they they could have been expressing their perception of their own uh, comp mm-hmm. as well. But we uh, to ex- ex- extract their more general the market, the sector, the, the overall situation in the Brazilian market. Something that we would like to 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 do in advance. The next uh, stage is actually an in-depth uh, perception of its own operation. I'm not oh, no, no, anonymized again, but trying to extract more of it, uh, looking inside instead of and see if it fits uh, with this general perception but not this was not uh, differentiated in this uh, survey unfortunately thank you also a question uh, for for bruno so after this the gradual build up of the institutions that made possible the the big bang and then the backlog you presented evidence on the uh, service to like li- elite positions in the companies, but is there any sense already of the perception of the general population regarding the institutions? So uh, I don't know, like trends in, in confidence in the different institutions involved before and after the Big Bang and the, and the backlog? Sure. Yes, uh, we we uh, yeah. Th- this is a very niched uh, uh, survey uh, targeting specialists. We do have the corruption perception index, but uh, it's uh, it's it's again. It's important to know that Transparency International famous corruption perception index is not the perception of common citizens. It's actually. Uh, the perception of uh, academics, business people, 
jurists. Uh, so because we use 13 uh, primary uh, surveys that we extract some of the response and make a stati statistic treatment. And then we we produce the, the CPI is all, it's not a good uh, the moment for your question because uh, it's too generic and, and fluctuates uh, not so much uh, in short periods. But but the Latino barometer during this period, period clearly showed a huge drop in the trust for democracy in Brazil. Uh, we have overall in 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 uh, in Latin America already historically low records of uh, trust in, in democracy, and during Lava Jato, the big the big bank, this uh, trust dropped significantly to the record low levels. So that also shows an, an impact of this big bank. The, the 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 risks of uh in, in democracy and then you again you open case for what happened here with the bolsonaro hijacking this this anti-corruption discourse uh but recently we have seen that trust is rebuilding after the experience of bolsonaro people it's thought that no democracy is actually something that we we need to to protect and value and there was a change and because this was more perhaps because it was more debated i don't know you academics would have better answers for that phenomenon but there was this the big bang made a drop but then the experience of this authoritarian government actually made uh, afterwards a, a regain of trust in democracy to Marcelo, how CGE is uh, trying to control this city budget that we invest in public work. Are you talking about this there? Because we are having this discussion in auditing courts. Can you talk about it? Uh, I, I don't know uh, if you... If you all got the, the idea that uh, Ajana is addressing. Uh, the point is to uh, how the, the the idea of secrecy, uh, secret budget is being uh, addressed uh, for, uh, from CGU or even for for uh, another agencies. The, uh, the idea of uh, public secret budget is a contradiction in terms. Uh, the, the idea is completely uh, anchored and I think it's one of the the, the, the greatest problems in, uh, of our uh, law enforcement model. Uh, CGU uh, it, it's uh, composed by many uh, uh, people that have uh, uh, strong backgrounds, their uh, solid formation, their their they enter in, in the career for for a public uh, uh, competition. However, they are linked to the executive branch. So they don't have the same independence that other agencies have. So there are initiatives, there are discussions, there are dialogues, but at the end of the day, we don't see the, the same power that they could have if they were an independent agency. That is a, is a huge problem on that. And just regarding the, 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 your question, uh, if, yes, if you are discussing uh well a, a progressive uh change or a, a big bend i i agree with bruno that we don't have this dilemma but you have this the, the, the both things i think lava jato uh, uh was uh, it's a brazilian case but we, we can consider this uh in italy you can talk about uh the same uh well environment of lava jato in, in other jurisdictions here in, in latin america but it was uh, uh, the, 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 the Big Ben, and we have the backlash. Uh, uh, I, I have a former colleague and now my friend, Samantha Dobrovsky, we have the expression that uh, uh, the efforts against corruption is like a pendulum. We have the, the Big Ben, and now the pendulum is bouncing back. So you have some some uh, uh, difficulties, and it uh, uh, it's comprehended that in the chilling effect of the, the persecution service, it is 
uh, it can be seen in some administrative sanction or, uh, uh, procedures against uh, the individuals that work on that. Uh, even in the budgetary issues, uh, we don't see uh, uh, many uh, uh, open uh, 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 procedures to uh, uh, accept another prosecutors or uh, auditors. There is no stimulus to to uh, to move on in that perspective. I, I think that the backlash, and I think we're, we're going to settle someday, uh, maybe preparing for another big bang. But uh, so far, we are in the, the, the opposite of the, the, that uh, that that figure of the pendulum I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Congratulations for the presentation. Um, last year, uh, my question is for Marcel. Last year, uh, the NCGU, we created a legal tool called Anticipated Judgment, Best Trial, something like that. It's kind of a free bargain for firms involved with corruption. And they uh, nutshell they confess they admit their responsibility in exchange for uh, benefits uh, and their punishments the better the benefits are smaller than the leniency but still are benefits and I wanted to know your opinion about the potential of this tool in combating corruption and reducing it that's my question thank you Thank you so much. It's a really good one. Uh, the idea is the the, uh, the the figure in in a rough translation would be the anticipated trial. Uh, the idea to uh, uh, judge in advance uh, since the company confessed it's the uh, it's the it's own wrongdoing. Uh, it's very similar that we have in the criminal uh, side of Brazil. Uh, we have a figure that is non-prosecution agreement and NPA. And you also have some figures very similar uh, in this uh, uh, whole branch that non try resolutions. You have also the plea agreement that you, you, you proper mentioned in the United States, for example. Uh, the idea is to reduce the costs so you won't spend many time uh, uh, producing evidence and, uh, and, and, and ruling the case. And you give some incentivations that are not quite uh, 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 broad when you compare to uh, the leniency agreement. But in this case, you also reduce the, the demands you impose to the, to, the, to the company since you don't need to expand another investigation or to obtain kind of damage. You just have the confession and try to settle the case. Uh, in a nutshell, good news. I have some, some, some. I think it's. Uh, I think it, it can generate some, some, some challenges, since it was not. Ba it was based on law, but it's a bylaw. Uh, so, if you consider the, the principle of legality, it's complicated because you're imposing and creating some procedures that are not uh, uh, driven by law. But see, when you're talking about consensus, you're talking about two parties trying to settle. I think it's not that complicated. Uh, but on, again, and since it's by law, you don't have clear framework on how to provide incentivization for those companies. I think it's that part to be a, a set of uh, maybe full legislation, but the idea to have a speedy trial, or especially when you're talking about, uh, uh, well, a hyper-sufficient uh, 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 company and well, well uh, oriented by, 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 by attorneys, I think it's not a problem at all and, and to be and to be true, uh, it's fast, it's cheaper. Well, I, I think it's a good call. Olá, bom dia, tudo bem? É, vou fazer uma pergunta a Bruno, que também é uma feito o assunto do orçamento secreto. É, eu queria entender primeiro essa percepção que a transparência internacional tem sobre a designação que se dá ao tema. Né? Às vezes chamam de orçamento secreto, às vezes chamam de outros nomes mais atenuados. Eles encaram isso até porque houve uma, 
do ponto de vista da comunicação de massa, houve uma mudança recente né, na terminologia empregada sobre isso e como isso afeta até a transparência do que está sendo feito no Congresso Nacional. E como você entende que há uma mudança dentro da política do poder legislativo, né, porque é um assunto disciplinado, inaugurado dentro de debates no Congresso Nacional e que o Executivo acaba tendo que, que executar, de fato, essa forma de, de planejamento orçamentário, como é que você acha que mudou o poder legislativo na legislatura anterior, na legislatura atual? É, porque me parece que eu me preocuparia muito mais hoje pela falta de debate sobre esse assunto do que na legislatura anterior. E acho que a sua percepção foi o contrário. Né? Foi que no, na legislatura anterior era um problema maior do que hoje, que hoje é o governo utiliza mais o governo, né? talvez se o governo fosse o, o Estado como um todo, né? utiliza mais do ponto de vista de... de passar uma agenda social que foi é, assim aceita no processo legislativo, né, foi eleita. E, diferente do governo anterior, salvo engano, você falou que era uma questão mais de interesse do governante de ocasião de se preservar no poder. É, será que não são interesses, se é que a gente pode falar sobre isso, igualmente escusos, né? Okay, I'll, I'll was asked to to repeat the question in English, so I'll try to. If I, I'm not uh, so accurate, please uh, uh, let me know and, and please correct me. Uh, the question was regarding this so-called uh, secret budget, uh, which was uh, this huge corruption in our uh, designation, a corruption, institutionalized corruption scheme, a macro corruption. Uh, institutionalized the uh, scheme. Uh, and the question, one part of the question was, uh, there is a change of uh, designation of this uh, scheme. Uh, it was called secret budget in the last government, and now there are some uses, uh, different, different terminologies that the press is using to soften down uh, perhaps the, the impact of this scheme in the current uh, moment. And the second uh, question, if there is a perception of the seriousness of this, uh, this scheme regarding the previous legislation in Congress, uh, legislature in Congress and the current legislature in Congress and the relationship with the executive, if it's not equally uh, obscure or... or, or um, Uh, unethical in, uh, as equally so so that gives me an opportunity to explain a, a bit better uh, our analysis of that so thanks a lot for the the question so it's hard uh, to begin with for foreigners to uh, understand such a thing such a bizarre absurd concept as secret budget right so this to begin with uh, was a challenge for me i have been trying to explain this to foreign audiences and that's the first challenge but i'll try in a nutshell to to summarize what was it uh there, there was this uh entity during the negotiation of the annual budget law that the member of parliament that was the rapporteur of the law that after all negotiations were concluded of budget allocations he historically had the prerogative the the, the possibility of making small changes in the final bill of, of of law to make corrections of material mistakes if someone put a zero more in the excel sheet there he could go there and and, and make corrections um so basically this possibility of uh, after closure corrections was completely completely distorted as a possibility to reopen and make re allocations according to political bargain in the shadow. So uh, that's the so-called, and we are talking about tens of billions of reais uh, in a country that has very small share of free investment or public investment. So um, in a nutshell, this was a scheme that actually reopened the budget, the budgetary negotiations, but under secrecy, 
and to uh, make this bargain between Congress and executive. And as I mentioned, in the last uh, government, that's a, a perception, there was very few uh, being, uh, of reforms trying to be passed. But there was a big concern that the Congress could revert after the investigations on the pandemic, see the CPI, etc., that the process would be a big threat to the, the former government. Okay, uh, so what happened afterwards? The, 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 the Supreme Court intervened after the election because the Supreme Court was afraid of intervening before because of the threats. He was afraid of Congress, with, was afraid of the Bolsonaro government. Uh, there was a real existence of the Supreme Court. So they waited the elections. They saw that the Bolsonaro government lost. And then they trial, they analyzed the, the issue and basically made the, the obvious uh, trial that it was against the Constitution, such a scheme. So uh, after that, the Congress and the government had to make adjustments in this scheme. And what they are doing now is that this budget allocation that was in the hands of the RAP, the hands of the commissions, in the hands of uh, individual uh, parliamentarians, uh, the allocation of the ministries, our budget within the ministries are now being allocated secretly in this style of bargaining. Uh, so we are calling the secret budget 2.0 total flex. <laughs> if you like, we are not changing the, the terminology. We think it's as serious as the others. We made this caveat that uh, at least this government, at least at the beginning now, there are no threats of in, impeachment right now. So uh, they're using that to reform or the re reforms. But is that uh, something that we need, we can tolerate? No, absolutely not. It's the same illegal form of relationship between the executive and the legislative. And not only that, this is a vicious cycle that we entered. After the secret budget in the Bolsonaro government, this parliamentarian group, very corrupt parliamentarian group that blackmails the, the government, it, its electoral result was outstanding because they used this secret budget to the elections to fuel uh, their uh, support at the local level. So their election result uh, was double the one in the previous uh, election. So this group of budget became even more powerful uh, with right now. So the current government is being blackmailed by this much empowered group ceding to this group. They are giving this money again. And then next year, they will again. And they have this huge amount of money to invest in the municipalities and to divert funds. And they, they will return uh, even stronger. So it's a vicious cycle. I, I say, you don't use crack socially. You know, that's what this government is. You don't negotiate with blackmail. With black and that's what, what's happening. Because they become even more powerful. And this is a non-ending cycle. So it's a very serious issue that I think uh, there must be a central debate on, on that for sure. Thank you. I have to finish now. Uh, I would like to... Oh, there's a one other one. Okay. To be the last, okay? <laughs> okay? So it's a question also to Bruno. Uh, I understood that uh, Bolsonaro was uh, responsible for dismantling the Lava Jato, as you said, right? My question is, uh, since the Supreme Court uh, is supposed to be independent, how he forced the Supreme Court to uh, cancel all convictions of the Lava Jato?
that's that's an, uh, an important uh, reflection. Uh, so we are advocating for an independent judiciary, and then the judiciary makes the decision to completely nullify the evidences that, such as the, the Ode, Odebrecht leniency agreement to, to nullify. But not only that, th there were two decisions by the Supreme Court that had huge systemic impact in the capacity of this country to, to fight grand corruption. Uh, one was uh, the reinterpretation of the Constitution regarding the execution of sentence after confirmation at second degree. Uh, because during the Lava Jato time, it was the interpretation that after a confirmation of second degree, sentence needed to be executed. Then so many powerful white collars individuals started to, to actually finally uh, spend time in, in jail. And then the issue was again discussed at the, the Supreme Court, and then there was a change of interpretation to go back to the uh, understanding that sentence could only be executed after the final appeal at the highest instance, which means that if you have power, if you have expensive lawyers, uh, you will never uh, pay for your to your wrongdoings, either in fines or uh, in, in jail time. That's a controversial issue, I know, because the Constitution also, I think there are reasonable arguments that what the Constitution says, but the the concrete impact was that in uh, white-collar crime and elite crimes in, in, in the country. And this was one of, this, of the two decisions. The other was to shift the comp of investigations and procedures from the federal justice to the electoral justice of any type of grand corruption schemes that had the minimal relationship of an electoral wrongdoing, and then it could not be trialed by the federal justice. It had to be investigated, trialed by the electoral justice. That made all the cases go back almost to zero, and not only that, ahead, that's the electoral just is not prepared in this country to face such comp uh, uh, financial grand corruption crimes. So uh, these were decisions by the judiciary where the um, where the impact to the capacity of the country to fight corruption. So should we not respect this is a, a, a sovereign decision by an independent power of course we need to respect a decision by 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 the judiciary and we advocate for this independence but we also advocate for due process of law so if you take the odebrecht uh, decision recent nullifying you see huge breaches of due process in this uh decision so Decisions should regard its uh, complete process. And second, checks and balances. So there should be in the, but not unchecked powers. So uh, it's extremely important to have an independent judiciary, of, of course, but no unchecked. So there should be mechanisms that also the judiciary needs limits to its powers. And it's a complex. A very dangerous decision uh, discussion because we know that authoritarian forces are trying to use this uh, dissatisfaction to, be, to actually attack the judiciary as a democratic uh, institution. So we need to be very careful with this debate, but I think it's a very important uh, debate on how we have uh, the balance of independence and accountability of the judiciary. Not only the judiciary, the prosecutors as well. Now we are finished our panel, but I would like to invite everyone to come here to take a, a photo for our for our event. Picture time.
you can see that the, the, the decision of shortening the opening session was very wise, right? Because the academic session that followed was wonderful. <laughs> Venham rápido, que depois tem um coffee break. E vai ser mais rápido ainda. Então, aproveitem para curtir o coffee break. Please go quickly para o coffee break. Towards. Just, just a little warning uh, for those who have the identical identification card. We may take a bag, like that. And for those who have that identification card yet, 
you may get now in your
Next time we get there, I'll show you.
Oh, oh. I'm oh, speaking English because we have to practice. Oh, what was the connection? Welcome to this session on political and judicial institutions. Um, Alvaro Bustos will uh, make the presentation first, 25 minutes, and we'll open five minutes for questions and answers. Um, then comes Luciano Ecasto, the next 30 minute block. And finally, uh, I'll be making the, the last presentation, and we'll have the end for questions uh, to whoever you want to. Luciano? Uh, Alvaro. 
All right. Uh, so, okay. So it's great uh, provocation, right? To start with the dollar. And I think about it. Organization. Uh, so far. All right. So, what I want to uh, do in this occasion is a joint paper with Nuno. Uh, that is titled, Why Do uh, Referenda Fail? Uh, this is the first time that we present this paper. So I'm pretty sure they... All right, so as a motivation, as probably many of the presents know, referenda refer to political that are called to play an important role in society. They are uh, meant to provide an opportunity Authors, the citizens of countries, different regions, to express their preferences about uh, important, relevant issues associated with their lives. And in that sense, then I think it's fair to mention that referenda are one of the foremost expressions of direct democracy. Aligned with that, then it's understandable why many countries in the world have the existence of referenda being the foremost or one important example of this, uh, Switzerland, because of Switzerland in the last 170 years has had of the order of 600 referenda to decide uh, on different uh, issues. Because of these uh, facts that I have mentioned, it makes sense that a lot of referenda, why they do exist, by like what generates or leads us to have those, also what is the impact of them, well, our intention with Nuno in this humbly contribute uh, to this literature by addressing just one specific focus question, which to our eyes has embedded a certain puzzle. So the question is written over there, which is how or why it may be possible that the proposal made by a body of legislators or drafters uh, could be rejected by the very same voters that elected the legislators and the draft or the drafters in the first place. And then when you hear this, you will be probably tempted to think, which is in part two, uh, but it's more behind this, that uh, this paper is motivated in the rather recent events that have been taking place in my country, in Chile, all this constitutional process in which the main events, I told you for the ones that are not that familiar, is that at the end of 2020, in October of that, that year, uh, Chileans manifested their desire to have a new constitution that was transformed into, in May of 2021, to election of a new constitution of members, such that those proposed the new text such that at the end of the last year, 2022 in September, the very same voters, it was a different mechanism, but the very same voters that had decided to go for a new constitution that elected the convention, this time voted overwhelmingly in the opposite direction to reject the proposal, right? So this is, uh, <clears throat> this should call your attention, this event on a number of angles, but one of them is that this, Outcome. If you see many other experiences in different countries, so I can mention here Spain, Iran, Iraq. Uh, what usually happens in this process is that they are overwhelmingly approved of the population of those countries. However, I want to make quite clear that even when the motivation of Chile is quite relevant, there are some other uh, stories or uh, things that feed in the question that essentially trying to explain and repeat to understand why is the case that legislators fail to understand to capture the preferences of the voters. So here, keeping the proportions, we were talking last night, right, at dinner about the Brexit case, which is a little bit marginal. We can talk more about that. But we have the situation that while in 2015, had elected a parliament, or maybe it was coming from a little closer from that time, uh, we were in the presence of a parliament that had a preference to remain in the UK. But one year later, we know what happened, that the voters decided uh, right to leave the, after that uh, association. On the other side, a very interesting case of the Icelandic constitutional process uh, tells us another set of interesting facts in which while in 2012, uh, the voters of the country decided in favor of a new constitution. Later, 
the parliament elected by the very same voters decided to stall or to prevent that that text will become the new constitution. Uh, the two is that the occasions that you can anticipate on why this happened. And here I can use some explanation tailored for the case of Chile, but this is not only relevant there, but people had hard, have argued that it might be that the incumbent political party has lost support. Misinformation is a favorite, the use of fake news, changes in preferences. All these are alternative some juicy uh, uh, events uh, that can be cat uh, categorized within the misbehavior of the drafters. So I brought some pictures here. Some of the drafters uh, will attend, it's difficult to believe, but they will attend using costumes. Uh, so that they have faked being ill, right, to gain public defense, participating in the, in the voting process by the well having showers, right, and this is completely true. Well, uh, you probably are anticipating that what we want to do here is provide an alternative hypothesis for the events that happen. Why we have elections in this context? And this hypothesis the explanation will not be based in the classic cases that I mentioned. There will be no irrationality, there will be no fake news, there will be no changes of preferences, but we will put our side exactly the opposite uh, side that it will be associated. On rational arguments built up. And more essentially, what we're saying is that after voters elect legislature, rational reasons will not be able to fully learn the preferences of the voters that will define pooling or either semi separated equilibria such that they will be making proposals that will be voting. Will appeal for some voters, but not all of them. So if you think very simply, yeah, simplified, Voters might be liberal or conservative. If a legislator elected is liberal, they might be tempted to make votes. What is surprising about this result, the main other yes, but one surprising characteristic is that rejections will happen even when legislators, together with both sides of the want the status quo to change. This is a scenario in which I hear some anecdotal evidence that in favor of that what we propose might have some bites. So for example, somebody will write the convention produces a two left, two radical, and probably two left. Or something interesting about the Chilean case is that two tensions were apolitical people with their ideological preferences. Those just become became more voting, and it became clear that uh, the convention was quite inclined to turn to the left. Nothing, nothing wrong about that, but probably didn't represent the medium inclinations of the Chilean. Uh, no time to go into the details of branches of the literature. The next to literature are five of them. I started school, the main or a thing. Literature that has described what we think about. Hence, the Chilean. Uh, Brexit, etc., etc., and in technical terms, later in the time, and also Lehman and Buffer problem later as will be mentioned. Action, which are the main contributions to the society, so we show we think, that double uncertainty can explain why proposals in this constitution fail, even when both, even when both agents want the status quo. General properties that link the probability of failure, action, we preferences, but also about distances, ideological distances. About the model, but uh, fortunately, probably for you, I will not have everything, right? But I will tell you a little bit about the model. After all, this last year, the derivation of the main results and extension. As usual in this type of model, everything happens in a continuum. It is from zero be more liberal to one more conservative, whatever. An ideological position. The civilians, who are we talking about? Uh, 
LE is legislator, such that each of them vote as a legislator. So we have two Okay, but if uh, something important is that but the legislators will only know that voters are liberal with a set of probability S. And voters on the other side. That is so important. In terms of the proof of the A simple game, but it's a huge uh, le legislator that means okay, of the simple portion the distance between ideal points and the outcome. There, there are no other choices. Costless referenda. Happy at the end of the time. But we pose assumptions to simplify the number of cases on the legislation. Addition to guarantee. Technically, we saw four genes just in red, but the combinations are two. And that legislators will be elected or not, right? So, if, uh, don't forget that we're dealing or hoping to get the problem. In terms of the solution, sorry that everything appears here. You can, yeah, we, we have the solution of the game in which there is complete information. Never happened, and essentially, voters so both of them will be What happens there is a legislation. What happens with the voters? Rejections are not a possibility. Well, the voters preferences and here what they think. If voters being far right, whatever I propose, with all the reality that that is indeed.
cái chữ trong phòng Tell me a line. It's just a gap. When rejection is a start, there's a certain concavity that later I will mention. The preliminary result. We deal with a with a case. It is later to be two times. Two story now will be only the liberal side. Right, so different graphs. Okay. And X is very small, right? But for a rejection to be they spend very strong. So have the same computer. I would save all the ugly math, but you can What the most part of a unique equilibrium.
the agents are rational, legislators will learn up to I just want to mention particular uncertainty is true that we hope. Result that we get. and costly. A friend, uh, even after the we derive all this result with this proper result on here. Okay, uncertainty. Ethical contribution and but uh, still have some I think questions are Don't don't be so harsh. <laughs> That we model it or the system? The, 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 right, that you have this exogenous uncertainty. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I can see that exogenous uncertainty about the voters seems like a provision. Right? The, the question I guess I have is you, you could imagine. Can't eliminate, but they could potentially. About their type, right? By you know, the way they can aim, they could indicate that they need either another. And I just I wonder if you thought of whether they would have an incentive to about the, you know, their ultimate goal of both getting elected, so as to influence.
I don't have a very good question. If you can, if that you can really summarize unidimensionally. I mean, for what we want to do, I think it will be enough to show that in both cases, it was just really I mean, the big puzzle for us is that some guys were elected by me, you proposed me something, and then it sucks, something like that, right? I mean, well, and there could be different uh, explanations, uh, we provide one. But... Thank you very much, Alvaro. And uh, so now we'll turn to the presentation by Luciano Ricasto. He's working. Morning, everyone. Uh, a pleasure to be here, and thank you very much for the organizers um, for this conference. Actually, this work, the first time that I developed this work, I wrote this paper in Portuguese and present a part of it in a conference that organized with Maurice Bergarini. I have a, this, this part here I never published, I didn't I decided to translate to English and now I'm presenting it. Question of the paper is how long should representatives be allowed to be in office? Of course, uh, I, will, I will tell this in a moment. Uh, I will uh, focus more on elected officials, but uh, I would argue, especially at the end, that uh, this model has some uh, something to say for non-elected officials as well. So, of course, the rules uh, of how long they stay in office has to be determined or written in the Constitution, so they have to be decided or predetermined uh, before the, the term starts. And uh, there are two goals that you want to accomplish. One is you want uh, the good representatives to be in power for a long time because they are uh, providing you a good service uh, for society. However, if the representative is not good, you want to get rid of it, of him or her, uh, very quickly, because you don't want to waste time with a bad representative. However, if the term limit is fixed, as uh, usually is the case and should be, so what you do, uh, right? You have a conflict between these two goals. Uh, so the question then is how you balance these uh, conflicting goals to try to get the best of them. And I would say that uh, the model that I'm going to present here is a very simple model, the simplest that I could think of. It's very simple. Um, there are some, of course, this means that there are things that are going to get lead out of the analysis, but I think it captures the, the main point. Let me... Let me tell you what, uh, first, a summary of, of uh, the things that I'm going to present. Uh, I'm going to uh, consider three options, basically. So first is a single long term without re-election. And then the question is, what should be the, li the term limit in this case? If you focus just to this issue of uh, one term without re-election. And then the question is, how long it should be? Then uh, you ask an uh, alternative situation where you allow the possibility of re-election. And in this case, I will, I will consider, you are going to understand in a moment why I, I will consider just one re-election. Then there is a separate issue, which is the recall, which is the possibility that you fix a term, and then you allow the possibility or not of recalling the representative, okay? And you're going to, I am going to argue that there is some relationship of re-election. And then uh, the last part, which you, you don't see here, but last part would be a kind of a combination of recall and re-election. I'm going to uh, end with that. Uh, 
as I said, the original motivation was Brazil. So some things that I would say that are more uh, inclined or developed or more tuned to Brazilian case, or, but uh, I would say that uh, it's more applicable to other uh, situations. Really. There are some uh, uh, that is exercise, I'll not spend much time on it, but to calibrate the model. So because of, I am going to show you there are conditions where you should go one direction or the other. So it's not a one solution fits all. So this depends on the parameters of the model that I'm going to explain. And uh, therefore, this means that there is an empirical question that you have to try to estimate the parameters of the model to uh, get uh, the final uh, uh, answer. But uh, at least we have a clear uh, condition what is important. So we give condition for election and give condition for the result. Okay, so I will skip uh, the literature of time. So as I said, main focus is elected representatives and I'm going to talk about elections all the time. So during the presentation, this is what you should be uh, have in mind. However, I argue at the end that we're going to, we can't say something about no elected officials, so judges, uh, district attorneys, this kind of thing. So there is an election at period zero. Uh, there are two types of representatives that they can select, the bad one and the good one. The good candidate uh, occurs with probability P, the bad one with probability one minus P. Uh, the, of course, the electorate does not know the quality of the candidate before the election. So, I mean, of course, the electorate can think, well, this is, uh, I'm forced to reveal the type, but this type is only revealed after the election. The good representative increases uh, the social uh, benefit to society by a, a number G. And here you can think of the difference between the bad and the good. Right, because I uh, normalize the bad representative at uh, providing zero services uh, to the society. Uh, so just to have some um, numbers in mind, uh, I, uh, I said, for instance, if you think that uh, the president, let's say that the representative is the president of Brazil, uh, what's the impact of a good uh, president with respect to a bad president? If you think that uh, it changes every year 0.5% of the GDP, then uh, this uh, G, uh, the contribution will be $8 billion. Okay. So you, of course you can go uh, uh, above or below, uh, you can go to $32 billion a year, but it does just to, to talk about what kind of uh, thing we want to capture the G. Uh, and then that's the more important part of the model is what happens after we elected. Okay, the point is that the services that the representative provides to society change in time. So we capture this with this function of a deteriorate, deterioration function, deterioration of the services. So in the first year, uh, a good candidate that could be uh, 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 good or bad, so this would be G or zero, Minus D minus one. This minus minus one. Uh, you you can think of this relation for two things. One is the laws of political power. So the government is elected, has a lot of power to change constitution, to change the laws, to make reforms, and then this power deteriorates through the year. So D minus one is the laws in this power by the end of the first year. So what he provides for the uh, society in the first year is. Q minus D minus one. D is a cumulative deterioration just because what happens, what matters at the end is the cumulative uh, deterioration. So um, I just, uh, each year is just uh, minus DT plus the previous one. So that at the end of T periods, if you fix T periods, you have uh, the production T times Q, which would be T times G or zero. Uh, this is uh, the baseline the contribution minus the deterioration, okay? That happens because this, the representative is in power for a long time. Uh, I would uh, I stress that this, is, this deterioration is important um, because this determines why you want or not to take out this representative. 
because and once I, I was talking with a political scientist and I said, why why it's negative? Why it deteriorates? Perhaps the guy is in the parliament and it becomes better at negotiating, at uh, knowing people. And actually, it produces more, not less. And if this happens, I would say, well, perhaps this is a case where you don't want to limit the the time that uh, he stays in power. So, and uh, well, a lot of uh, countries have this uh, rule of. Uh, Allowing legislative uh, people in the house, legislative uh, legisl uh, legislators, to remain power indefinitely, right? So this could be one uh, justification. But uh, as I'm stressing, uh, the deterioration is an important part of the whole story here. Uh, there is also the the issue of corruption. Okay, so why the government becomes uh, less efficient because it becomes more and more corrupt with time. And uh, I mean, this is, I think that's a reasonable assumption also that corruption is uh, Okay, so first let's uh, consider the, the possibility of uh, re-election. If there is a possibility of a re-election and a recall, uh, we're going to talk more about this for later, but uh, I, a bad representative will not be re-elected. Okay, so if you go, because the, uh, you know the qualities revealed after the election, it is in power, so you know if it's good or bad. If there is an opportunity for the electorate to decide again, to go for an election, the bad candidate will get out or will be uh, empowered. If there is an election, then you have other possibilities. Well, one thing is you can re-elect the guy or you can get a new draw. And then the new draw will be a good or bad candidate. And of course, uh, what will happen depends on the parameters of the model. So if there is a re-election, yeah, this is the thing, right? When there is a re-election, um, you, you gain a new power. So if you think about the deterioration, uh, after the elected, you, you are going to get back to a, a, a little bit of the power. So I, I assume that the deterioration uh, stops. Uh, it's like a clock resets. However, the contribution it's not necessarily the same. It could be the same, but it's not necessarily the same as the initial one. So this is why you start contributing G, but after two terms and you are reelected, then your contribution is G, T. Okay? And this may verify. And uh, so just a uh, uh, rationale for this. Uh, a few years ago, uh, Lopes Obrador, the president of Mexico, was uh, he wanted to have a recall election. And I think, well, why this guy want a recall election? Well, because once you get a reelection, your power is increased, right? Because you have a support of the electorate. So it may be crazy, but uh, this is this is the possibility of uh, what's behind here. The fact that you get a power, then you reset your uh, deterioration. So if you, uh, the total contribution of the second term will be then T times GT minus, again, DT. So the total uh, contribution in with the relaxation will be G in the first term times T and GT times T, which is comes from the second term, minus two times the deterioration, okay? So very simple model, as I said. Uh, of course, we're going to assume there is some convexity, uh, and the convexity uh, takes the following. If you just keep, instead of, let's say, here in Brazil, let's just to fix uh, T is four years, but you have the possibility of election. So it's four years plus four years. So the deterioration, if you don't have election in the middle, the deterioration of eight years, I'm assuming here that this is bigger than the deterioration of four years and then four years. And I think that is a reasonable assumption uh, to make in, in, in this. Uh, there is a particular example for uh, that satisfies this. Uh, that's the exponential function. Uh, I'll not spend much time on this. Uh, some of the results that I'm presenting here will depend on this, but uh, most of them uh, will not. Um, of course, then you can ask. Uh, I'll, I'll skip this part here. That is an attempt to try to give some idea if you use this use this uh, power function. You have two parameters to estimate A and alpha, but in, in, because of time, I will skip this part here and then go to the analysis of the one-term um, case. 
So in one term, what you do? So if you do one term, and then there is no possibility of re-election, uh, you're going to get, uh, if the candidate is good, you're going to GT minus DT, that's the payoff for society that uh, is produced by the good candidate, or the candidate is bad, and then you have just deterioration. So this is why G is just a, a contribution, right? It's the difference between the bad and the good. And of course, there is C, which is the cost of the election. Okay, uh, and you divide by T. This is the number of uh, periods, uh, and this is important because uh, as you increase the period, you are going to do less elections. If this election is important, this has to be taken into account, right? This is why this is here. So you can ask yourself. Uh, so the uh, as I said, the uh, exercise is to ask what's the optimal term. And then we ask, well, of course, this will depend on everything, right? It depend on the probability that the guy is good, right? Because if it's a good probability, we to have more elections. Or, uh, it depends on G, what's the contribution of the good candidate. Uh, depends on P, depends on the deterioration, depends on everything. Do you think that this is true? Do you think that depends on C, uh, on G? Well, when I started, I thought that the due to it depend on everything. But the interesting thing here, and this, as I said, it's a very simple model, but already gives a, the first surprise is this. The optimal period does not depend on the probability of the candidate to be good and does not depend on how good it is. Or if, I mean, it's not relevant for the determination of the period. What is relevant? And then you... The relevant is just the deterioration. The only thing that's relevant is the deterioration. Here, uh, in this assumption, is uh, determined by the the parameters of uh, the deterioration function, the exponential. And so it depends on the deterioration, and second, depends on the cost of it. Okay? It does not depend on how good on the probability. And I think that this kind of thing, uh, just to see on what the term depends, right? Um, I mean, this is uh, more or less easy to. Uh, that is a technical. You may think that's trivial to prove. Actually, this this function is not concave, so there is a little technical. I mean, it, it, it has to work a little bit. Okay. Uh, so some uh, some comments on the model. Uh, this model does not account for the possibility that there are some policies uh, that may take a very long time to implement, right? I'm not, uh, sorry, I'm just, uh, there is a contribution, but say that you want to change the, how the country is organized. This takes time. And if you, you get the optimal, um, the optimal term here does not capture this. So it's out of the model. Uh, we also do not uh, consider preference over projects. Although, uh, exactly in, in Alvaro's direction, if uh, the, the preference of the electorate does not change, then you may think that this G is just the preference of the median voter. So I don't think that's a big problem here. Uh, but uh, also, uh, the model, and this leads to the problem. about what I said before, right? Why do you want re-election? You want re-election because you want to change the bad candidate, but you want to keep the good one. So that, but if you, in, in this model with just one term, you cannot take anything in the between, right? You just elect and then you have to suffer or enjoy the candidate for the whole term. Well, it's much better if you can change. And then this leads to the re-election or the recall, okay? And this is the next So with re-election, what you have to consider? So he stays in power, that's uh, just the simplest model, right? He stays in power for T period, and then there is a re-election, and the bad candidate's not going to be re-elected, and the good candidate may be re-elected. Uh, so what, when is the case that, um, uh, this is superior to have just one term. Because there's also 
uh, Modesto Cavalhoz, uh, one of his proposals of uh, the Constitution of Brazil. And uh, one one thing that he criticizes is likely the fact that we have re-elections. The re-elections are bad, right? And then you say, well, perhaps it's better just to have one term and no re-election. And this, of course, is, re is associated with the cost of, uh, I, I would argue that this capture also in the deterioration function. But anyway, here in this model, that's a very simple model, as uh, I said, uh, it boils down to this simple condition. This is uh, the situation with one term, T, and this is the situation with the re-election. It's better for society to have this if uh, the contribution or uh, or that after re-elected is bigger than the contribution before election times the probability. It's a very simple condition. But uh, you can take into account now the, the problems, uh, of course, to get this in, in the dynamic set, and you have to have like a fixed point of the value of the game, right? Uh, so with the probability, you have the good candidate and this is the outcome, he will probably one minus P, this is, uh, you, you, the, the guy is not reelected, and you go back to the starting situation, which is you you draw again a good or bad candidate. And this is the X here. Um, so uh, then you can obtain the, the what's the value of this game uh, that comes from um, sorry, and you have the following proposition. The source site benefits from re-election compared to the situation with just one term. If a good candidate is re-elected, it's a very simple condition. So you, you, I think why is the case that the good candidate is not re-elected? You are going to not to re-elect the, the, even knowing that the good candidate is there. If GT is not good, uh, good enough, so the thing that he's, he's going to produce before, after the elections is not good. And uh, it depends on the probability of getting a good candidate. So it's better to, uh, to do this. This is a very simple condition uh, that captures uh, this. Well, this is not uh, the end of the story because I compared it just with the same uh, period. So one question is, what about if I change the period? One thing is, uh, 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 here, your term we, uh, or a single term without relax, and the periods are different. So, for instance, you could have, and there are, I have seen this proposal as well. Instead of four years, you have five years or six years of a mandate, but without relaxation. So, is it better than uh, uh, four years and plus four years with, with the reelected? So, of course, you, you could compare with the best possible uh, duration of the single term, that's TS, which is given by the previous part of the paper. And yet, so the relaxation is strictly better than a single term if this condition happens. And this condition is a little bit stricter than the previous one. Okay, okay so let's consider, well, I have very few moments. Uh, recall, recall, to, to analyze the recall, you have to take into account the cost of the campaigns and the cost of the elections because you are going to do more elections and you have to take into account this cost, right? Um, so again, you have the probability, what you get if it's a good candidate. Uh, again, you have the cost of election if it's bad. So if if it's bad, then you have the possibility of calling a recall. But the recall requires the collection of signatures, and there is some implication in terms of uh, instability in the country. I will ca uh, capture this as C recall, and this is the uh, payoff that the society has in the case of recall. Uh, the, 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 the result is the following. We produce a recall in period P, so, so the period P is, uh, so usually uh, rules for recall require a minimum time that you can't uh, call for recall, right? So sometimes it's six months, sometimes three years, but uh, there is a minimum period that, uh, so there, is, there was the election in November, October, you cannot call recall in January, right? So you have to wait a little bit, and this is period P. So 
uh, as long as the period P is bigger, then uh, they will call me. Uh, so th there is a complicated connection here. Uh, and I have very few moments. Let me just jump off this because um, this model here is still not uh, exactly what I wanted to consider because I would like to consider the combination of uh, recall with relapse. And this is, I think, that uh, thinking about this led me to this uh, proposal. What is this? The proposal is that. Uh, you and just to fix ideas here, right? Uh, I'm very uh, constrained in time. So I have a let's say that you have a period of two years to get a recall, and you do not require or do not allow uh, the uh, or do not require that uh, the recall uh, is called for with signatures. You just mandate, and then that you uh, eliminate all uncertainty about the. Uh, they recall being elected or not. Remember in Venezuela a few years ago in Chavez, they tried to do a recall and then there the signatures and then the electorate uh, body didn't uh, approve and all these things. And you have a lot of uncertainty just because of that. And here, let's say that it's mandatory that will be a recall, right? And here in Brazil, it would be a very simple one because every two years we have election. We already have election. So think about every two years you go there and then you vote to take out the president, the governor, the uh, mayor, or not, okay? So that's uh, that's the proposal. So in this case, you have a, a, a bunch of things. Let's say that you have here a term of eight years. It's a fixed term, but every two years, you have the possibility of recall. So you recall in the first two years the bad candidate, or you don't. So if you don't, uh, after two years, so, Bad candidate to be recalled the first, uh, in the first, uh, in the after two years. If it's a good candidate, it can be recalled as well, depending on the out, uh, outside alternative, or it can be confirmed. And then you go, you can be recalled in the two, in four, or six year, and then eight years the term ends. So it's a possibility. So let me the, the main results of the paper. There are four situations of the parameters there are uh, you can only use. Uh, a bad rule is always recalled uh, after the first recall election that you want to be as uh, fast as can as you can but you don't want uh, too fast because there is the issues of learning and that is also the cost of election uh, but uh, with this uh, four situations here what happens? A good ruler is recalled in, in second period. Even the good ruler, everybody is recalled in the first, second period. The other, in the other case, uh, a good ruler is recalled, is, not, is confirmed in the second period, but recalled in, in period four. And then you go. Uh, it's a good ruler uh, is maintained for two years and uh, recalled in six, or it will go the, all, all the way. So, and they, this uh, will prove that's actually better than all other uh, situations. So with this proposal, uh, then the call is also preferred than the single term uh, mandate, provided that this happens. So the, what, that's the problem. The cost of the elections cannot be too fast, too high. So if you have a too high cost of election, then you don't want to have a lot of elections. Uh, let me just uh, comment very quickly, 30 seconds, about, I said about uh, the application of this to non-elected officials. You can uh, apply this. The main issue is um, uh, the deterioration function. So the loss of the deterioration is exactly what I said at the beginning, right? If you have uh, non-elected officials, you may want them to stay in power for a long period if there is no deterioration. But if there is deterioration, then you may need to impose a mechanism to take this guy out and then substitute for a new one. And I'll stop here because of time. Thank you. Roberto is recommending that we postpone the to the end. Okay.
Now, no, if, if there is, oh. yeah, let's, is it okay to do it? Yeah, because it's, it's easy to make. Go ahead, Alvin. Get out after three years. And that you might think that the two. Yeah, so I would say that uh, one key point to this is exactly the separability between the uh, the quality and the deteriorate. If you put them uh, in a non-separable utility, then uh, you you're going to have exactly what you're proposing. Right, that's right. So. Uh... Thank you very much. Uh, the, the parliamentary uh, comment will take a longer bit, so uh, I, I don't want to take uh, more his time. Just to, to talk about the, the, the discount, uh, we can capture this at least in the de deterioration function. Yeah, you can. The only problem is the, uh, the if it's not separable, if it's separable, you can. Because you you just write there, the DDT is what uh, is lost. The only thing that you can think of it's not there is the thing that if it's separable or not of the quality. Congratulations for your work. I'm also studying. Uh, you have less attractive system by the the strategic. How they are they have a a, a very high seasonality. Actual years, yeah. Uh, budget, uh, the, uh. Revenues and the, of the four four year number. Like two years. Uh, what is the of the recall and reelection for the
now we have a very high seasonality. Doing so would enhance the the energy or not? Very quick, I'm sorry, uh, uh, and, um, I would think, and I have to check, but I, I would, uh, my guess is that because you're using a very short period, at least in this proposal, uh, P equals two. So if uh, you're going to get uh, making these transfers, you have to make this transfer almost every year, and it becomes the part of the policy. So the fact that you uh, reduce the period of election makes this strategy almost... Uh, uh, not uh, it doesn't work. It takes out uh, its uh, effectiveness because you get uh, the manipulation. But uh, if you do the manipulation, you gain one year. Then the next year, the the country is not going well. Then you are going to be recalled. So uh, I think that will be uh, actually another advantage of doing this system. Um, it's very nice to be in this session. So this is a case study that involves uh, constitutional change. So uh, this the case study has to do with the 1994 constitutional reform in, in, in Argentina, and um, the reform was caused by by the incumbent president. The existing constitution allowed re-election, but not immediate re-election. The president had to wait at least one term out of office before seeking re-election, but he was very popular, so he pushed. So the motivation uh, of the reform was being reelected, um, and he got it. Uh, but uh, he, he had to strike a, a deal with, with the opposition, and that's what we we'll talk about. And this, uh, in my reading, has affected the Supreme Court, so I'm going to mention the institutional changes, then discuss it with the spatial model, where uh, I guess it's the spatial model that well, we've been discussing in this session with that case. I reinterpret uh, the spatial model and ideal point in terms of insiders to the judicial system, outsiders, people that are um, follow a norm of justice versus people who's not making their party win. Um, so, um, uh, the thing is that we, we've had, well, since 2002, these administrations by the uh, Kirchner, and uh, they didn't hesitate uh, between 2007 and 2015 to replace uh, uh, people that measured inflation with premiums and with prison inmates. So we, we didn't measure inflation between 2007 and 2015. We just uh, Prevented it, uh, but uh, the same thing didn't happen with the judicial system. So, and that was not for lack of uh, desire of the, of the president. Uh, and uh, so, this paper is placed within that the literature, the pol political economy uh, of law literature that looks at um, how uh, unified government or uh, divided government can help separate the independence. Uh, can help preserve the independence of uh, the Supreme Court and the judicial branch. And uh, in this, I start out describing the, this case study, the 1994 constitutional reform, that uh, before I did this study, I had always been against, because I thought if the president was elected for one term, he could do a constitutional reform, but uh, not to be immediately re-elected. So, uh, when this reform was carried out, I was opposed to it. But uh, 
this had some other changes that I think are really important. That maybe the, the contribution, uh, potential contribution of my study is uh, that it leads to discuss something that uh, I haven't seen. Maybe it's been done, but I haven't seen, because most of the discussion I've seen in particular for the US is uh, about Supreme Court justices uh, like Clarence Thomas, that's more to the right, uh, others like Ruth Ginsburg that are more to the left, ideological differences. But in Argentina, the discussion, uh, that's not the discussion. It's like what in the, in the first session, the president uh, naming in the Supreme Court or appointing the Supreme Court people that are loyal uh, to him or to her. That's our problem. So it's the quality of the justice. The other thing, we look at the US Supreme Court from Argentine point of view, well, it's a luxury because you, you all have uh, whatever their ideological leaning, they're jurors. So for that, uh, uh, there, there comes a twist in the spatial model. Think of it in terms of Akerlof and Cranton's uh, model of identity economics, people that are insiders to an organization or outsiders. So uh, the, the history of the Supreme Court is, well, um, it, it was established in 1853, uh, but the, w in 1946-47, there was a very dramatic process of impeachment of four of the five justices. The only justice that wasn't impeached was the one that had been named in 1943 by the military government that gave a coup that year. Fidel was vice president of that military government. And then he made a transition from military to civilian service. And so he declared there, I put the spirit of justice above the judicial power. Justice, besides being independent, must be effective. But it cannot be effective if its concepts do not march in compass with public sentiment. It's my translation. The judicial power does not speak the same language as the other powers. Well, it almost present, and the two chambers of Congress were controlled by Fairness Party. And so the impeachment required a supermajority, uh, but he got it. Two thirds of the vote uh, of the lower chamber and two thirds of the Senate. Uh, Menem tried uh, something else, uh, a court uh, packing scheme. So uh, I guess Pedon could have done the same in 1947, but he made a point of uh, impeaching the four of the five sitting ju justices. Uh, and he, uh, he was able to do that because the Senate has been controlled since 1946, almost continually by the Pyrrhonist party. So uh, basically a Pyrrhonist president usually has a majority in the Senate. So whatever uh, he want to, wants to pass through the Senate, it's possible in particular to name a Supreme Court justices because uh, they always have a majority or almost a majority. Um, in 2003 and 2005, um, um, there was also an, an impeachment process, but unlike the, uh, the process that Peron did in 1947, the opposition uh, uh, joined uh, the incumbent party, the parent party, to remove the judges because they were the what was called the automatic majority that had been appointed by Menem in 19. Um, so that's that's the background to, to what I'm going to discuss. And so I'm going to make a distinction in these three episodes between insiders and outsiders. So um, there are the main institutional changes had to do with the uh, 1990. Uh, for constitutional reform, but there was a prior one in 1958. Uh, because in 1946, there was proportional uh, representation in the lower chamber, but two thirds of the representatives went to the most voted power, that was Peronism, a third to the opposition. That's why they don't have to control two thirds of the lower chamber, and he could uh, accuse or uh, start the impeachment process against the Supreme Court. In 1958, the system changed to proportional representation, much more proportional. So after that, no president ha has can control two thirds 
of the lower chamber unless they reach an agreement with the main opposition party. The Senate, uh, it also changed because until 1994, the party that had the most vote in a given electoral district, the province named both senators. Uh, in 1994, a third senator was elected. So this also makes it harder for, a, uh, until 1994, Peronism basically uh, could control two thirds of the Senate. After that, uh, it's a lot harder. And possibly. And a, a watershed, uh, an, a, another thing that marks the watershed is that now, not only to impeach the justices, but to name them, you need support of two thirds of the Senate. So this implies, this is like the, in the US uh, Senate that uh, before um, you, you needed not a majority of the Senate, but uh, rather with a filibuster, we needed first, I think it was two thirds and then 60% of the votes of the Senate. Well, uh, this was introduced in, by the 1994 Constitution to name a, a Supreme Court justice, you need two thirds of the vote. And well, there's something about federal judges that got. Uh, so, um, so the, the point here is that um, I think about the spatial model uh, using these ideas of identity and Akerlof and Cranton, where they say, well, each of us has a, a certain identity, a certain role that we can fulfill in life, sometimes several roles. This comes from psychology and sociology. But each role has a given norm associated to it. So here I'm going to think of three categories. J is a jurist or judicial branch, people that are identified with the judicial system. And A and B are the political parties. A is the party to the left, B is the party to the right. And the uh, the norms of the political, of, of um, the outsiders of the judicial system, they're insiders of the party system. They want to help their party. Um, in this sense, um, I can, I have to track the votes, but um, I have, um, a friend, an economist from Uruguay, Alvaro Forteza, that couldn't believe that one of the judges that Menem appointed to the court, um, Rodolfo Barra, he said, I'm in the Supreme Court to defend the president's policy. He openly said that. He was part of that automatic majority. One of the um, Supreme Court, uh, by Kirchner, 10 years later, or 15 years later, um, um, he said, um, I have to be ungrateful to those that named me. Uh, my role here is to uh, not apply what I want to do, but what the Constitution says. So that marks the difference between Barra was a, an insider of the political system, but not of the judicial system, so freedom as an outsider. And uh, the other uh, nominee, well, she was an insider. I can't remember her name now, if I recall it. And so uh, these positional issues, I re reinterpret them in terms of the norms associated with each type. So uh, here, what matters is the distance between the policies and the norm that each type has. This is a oversimplification because different justices uh, interpret the Constitution in different ways. So uh, we, we would have to add another term to capture the idiosyncratic differences between Clarence Thomas, for example, and Ruth Ginsburg. But I'm forgetting about that, and I'm looking like at the medium of the Supreme Court and saying, well, their main mission is to uphold the Constitution or to interpret the laws as they were uh, approved by Congress. And there's another uh, term that has to do with uh, valence issues. So, um, types UA and UB, the, uh, here I'm adapting something that uh, Fortes and, and uh, Pereira did for separation of powers. They, uh, they like rents for their party because it might help them in political survivor. They dislike rents for the other party where the type UJ that they're insiders of the justice system, they dislike all other rents. So this is a gross oversimplification because not all justices and judges are honest. 
not all politicians are dishonest, but well, that's true. Uh, and so uh, with this, one way of seeing the 1947 impeachment, the justices were, I'd say, insiders. The, the tradition, the Supreme Court, until 1947 was naming insiders. The thing is that Peron, that is point A, he had uh, he controlled two thirds of the lower chamber and the total Senate. And so the pivotal legislator was in his block. And so he could remove uh, the justices that were insiders despite the opposition of the opposition party. The case in, with Kirchner was completely different. Uh, because uh, the medium justice was minimum change from uh, left-wing policies to right-wing policies. The, the justices were seen as uh, far to the right. When Kirchner uh, uh, came into office, he reverted back to a more traditional Peronist policy. And uh, Kirchner needed the opposition, but the opposition agreed to remove these justices because they were people like Rodolfo Barra, that their defining characteristic was being loyal to Menem or uh, to his faction. And so uh, uh, they were able, Kirchner was able to remove all those justices. In, 40, in 1947 and 1990, uh, basically Peron and Menem were able to name what I'd see as outsiders of the judicial system, people that responded to them. But in 2003, 2005, two of the justices were impeached, three others resigned. And the thing is that uh, my interpretation, many people said, well, these guys are really legally qualified. Well, there's a phrase in Montesquieu, even virtue needs limits. Uh, Kirchner did that because he had no choice. He needed, since you needed two thirds of the Senate to appoint um, uh, new chief justices, the opposition didn't want uh, somebody uh, uh, identified with the Peronist party because uh, uh, they would, if whoever controlled the medium justice would uh, would apply their policy. So they preferred it, it, judicial insiders to judicial outsiders. When Kirchner had been uh, governor of Santa Cruz, he did the same thing as Menem. He wasn't constrained. He named uh, henchmen to control uh, the Supreme Court of the province of Santa Cruz. That's uh, really the part. Well, I'll, I'll skip this. And so um, I think this reform that uh, initially I didn't like, it marks a watershed because, well, one, one thing it does is helps preserve the independence of the judicial branch. But I think that also it has affected, and that's what I've tried to argue, the quality of the justice. So uh, whether they're more left-leaning or right-leaning, the quality has changed. So we've returned to a track that we had abandoned in, I'd say, 1947. In 1983, when uh, democracy returned, Alfonsin, that he was from uh, the radical party, he had to negotiate with Peronism. So there, what you got was a decent, I'd say, Supreme Court. They had to name insiders because of that restriction. And I think that this reform has placed uh, the Supreme Court back on track. And I think that uh, this is one of the main building blocks if you want to achieve a system of rule of law. You have to have uh, a Supreme Court that's actually committed to the law being observed. Thank you very much. Does anyone have a question? Uh, one very interesting thing to Jorge. So what, one question. So so your your argument essentially is that because there is divided government, the people that get appointed to the court. Uh, there has to be some bargain in the part across parties, and they appoint more moderate guys. But 
so why does not, it, there is another possibility that uh, since the court can be packed because the number of judges is not in the constitution, so the government can increase the number of vacancies and then struck another type of bargain that is you get one radical, you get one inside, one outsider for you, another insider for me. So that then they agree on, on the vote, uh, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't get the better quality court that you are. Uh, that you are. Well, that, that's, that's a problem. But Cristina Kirchner, she's tried to impeach uh, Chief Justice in 2013. There's a, an impeachment process going on right now, but Massa, the, the candidate, postponed it to after election. So he, because uh, he's been accused of trying to remove the court, not say where he stands. And Cristina Kirchner had a, a proposal of expanding the court from five members to 25, basically to get the governors on board. So each governor could propose uh, somebody to the court that responded to them. All, all would be outsiders to the judicial system. So it would be like collusion. So corruption won't be investigated for time being. That hasn't worked, but it's a definite possibility. But uh, the thing is that if the demi uh, the uh, medium member of the court is pyrrhonist, well, they'll want to, uh, unless you have a way of assuring the deal, uh, they'll uh, look one way for corruption of the pyrrhonist party and another, and another for the opposition. So there's a risk involved there. But uh, there is an example in the province of Buenos Aires where there's collusion between Peronism and the other party and the, to distribute rent. So th th that's a distinct possibility. Here in this model, uh, the opposition prefers insiders in the judicial system because of the question of rents. Insiders dislike rents for everybody, whereas an outsider of the other party wants rents for everybody. Thank you very much, and uh, you'll have lunch. Um, everyone, now we go to lunch, and we're back. Um, 2 p.m. Okay. P.m. Rebel.
Yep. Yeah. Let's have a drink of water before it starts. <laughs> Doesn't work. Oh, coming on now. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, I think you can make some of it.
Mike, are you there? Are you listening to us? Yes, sir, Michael Taylor. Yes, I, I can I can hear you now. Uh, can you hear me? Wonderful. We can hear you and see you. That's great. So we are starting our session on the Twin Peaks Regulation. We are very, very honored to have Professor Michael Taylor here with us. In addition, Andrew Smulo and Professor Dave Eichmann. Uh, in, instead of uh, taking time uh, introducing the, the speakers, I'm going to let them talk because that's the way to get the most advantage uh, of the, the time we have. So this is how I, I plan to do it. First, Professor Michael Taylor will make his presentation. Then Professor Andrew Schmuro make his presentation. And then they, Professor David Eichmann uh, will follow. And once the three of them finish, then we uh, there will be a period of discussions that would involve you uh, and and anybody in the table too. Uh, is that okay this way? And of course, while uh, one of the presenters is presenting, the other ones can intervene or complement whatever they wish. So if if we all agree with that. Let me uh, hand uh, the microphone to you, Professor Michael Taylor. And before completely handing the microphone to you, let me ask you dearly for your effort to uh, to help us and to contribute. You are you are the main in this area, and it's a, a great, really great honor to have you with us. So please go ahead. Well, thank you very much, and, and thank you for the kind invitation to, to speak today. Um, I'm sorry that I can't be here with you in person, but um, I, I feel a little bit like Big Brother sitting up here on the screen, uh, it being uh, shown in, in such large size. But um, hopefully I, I can give you some kind of overview of Twin Peaks and where we uh, came from in terms of the P Twin Peaks discussion. Uh, and also what has happened over the last 30 or so years. I'm going to share my screen. I have a, a short presentation. Um, so let me turn to that now. Uh, I hope you can see that. Um, so uh, essentially, I'm, I'd like to review the experience of Twin Peaks since 1995, which was when I first proposed the concept of a twin structure of financial regulation. Uh, and uh, a lot of things have happened in those in the past 30 years. I, I had many fewer gray hairs in those days than I do now. Uh, and a lot of things have, have changed and moved on. But I think it is helpful to think about the, the background and the context to the discussion around Twin Peaks and why it's still relevant when thinking about the right type of regulatory structure. Now, I'm going to have four main uh, components to the presentation. First of all, I'll talk about what motivated the original Twin Peaks plan. Uh, secondly, why did the sin single integrated regulator model, which was basically the one that the UK adopted, uh, the Financial Services Authority, which existed between uh, 1998 and 2011, uh, why did that model prevail? Uh, and why was it then adopted in quite a number of other countries? Uh, thirdly, I'll look at the lessons learned from the global financial crisis. And then finally, I'm going to touch on what reforming the institutional structure can achieve, and importantly, what it can't achieve, because there are many other aspects to effective regulation that the structure itself doesn't directly affect. So without further delay, let me move on to the first part of the presentation. Uh, and look at what were the objectives of regulatory reform in the UK way back in the, in the early 1990s. Well, one of the first um, issues that uh, uh, I seem to have, uh, uh, am I still on the connection? I seem to have lost a connection here. Have, have we lost the connection?
Onu da hisnadan arttı. Bound with for a financial. Potential regulators thanks to the bigger and better capital. It recognizes these two forces. I would differ with Dr. Taylor. Of the institution. Eight banks are also in Other alternative is the regular. Definition of the product, bring it under whichever regulation. It's well, right. Any ways is there are for me to those of you who are not lawyers and you
instead of creating a twin. Created a prudential peak. Everything else you can think of except that. of Northern Rock and the collection Commons and House of Lords and Clark. There is an there is We've had a decade of failure. Salt population of Australia. Currently captured by industry.
this country to adopt in peace. Thank you very much, Andy. I used to be a financial regulator. I saw the process when we moved. My presentation is really going to be good. I'll try and do that at least. It's a how I can do it. Um, you've already been told that there are three. A little bit of data, which is true that the sexual model. Completes Andrew. As you described it, as it you know, it's about. Or do you want to see what that looks like? Up there. Um, up show, we have like this one. Created something you can just connect. Government that was elected in ninety seven. Well, 
busted until the financial crisis. Government and they scrapped it, created a new change. FSA was Timmy Bassano? Yes. Why it went wrong. I mean, I think it's inevitable that that structure would have gone wrong. I think I have a slightly different perspective to Andrew on this. But there were two, like, key, absolutely key. Made its demise and inevitable. The first one is it is a principles based. I deliberately said the market is right. These are banks, you know, to behave, manage risk properly, and you know, that. um. The second key failing rule was around crisis management arrangements. Something that we call a, a tripartite system. Every so often, out of the Bank of England, what are the risks we're seeing in the financial system? The individuals did not like each other. The top, but all the way down. Spoken extensively with all the all worked in the central bank. I think personal relationships are one reason. Um. Uh, a very nice. It's the chairman of the FSA who took over in 2008 after the financial crisis was in its kind of most strong. Gentleman called Adair Turner, and he wrote a, um, I think, a very honest review of what went wrong, and he blamed. Light touch regulation, as I've mentioned, some of the things that Michael mentioned in his presentation in terms of an inability to or insufficient attention placed on basically ignoring liquidity regulation, tilting the balance towards conduct of business regulation, and really just not acting proactively enough in terms of banks' capital position. The adoption of Twin Peaks, uh, the reforms in the UK that were started the governments took over, and the current system we have in the UK. I'm afraid our world is full of acronyms. PRA, which is the product. I'll make sure they don't fail. Their objective is in terms of. And then we have the FCA, the Financial Fund, um, whose main job is to terms for conduct purposes, but there's a little asterisk, much smaller investment firm. The macro prudential committee that was set up. Um, Michael said that I think it's completely true. One benefit of this twin peak structure is you can give these regulators different objectives. Quite clear. Safety and soundness of firms is the PRA's job. Conduct of business, consumer protection. Overlaps with something I think both of you, but like what are the benefits of this twin peaks approach? 
share notes extensively before the talk. So this is kind of my take on, on some of the benefits. Um, I agree very much with what Andrew said in terms of the skill sets and mindset for these roles are really quite different. And it is like a law versus economics. So reg prudential regulation is economics. Essentially. Um, Michael said something in terms of, um, you know, you will inevitably, tension will inevitably gravitate towards the conduct side of it. I agree with that. So I think the reason for that is conduct issues are very high frequency, high profile, they're always in the news, they're always happening. There's always one mis-selling scandal after another. For some reason, consumers are in it. Whereas prudential issues are really low frequency. It's kind of a crisis issue, right? So only time this ever appears really in the newspapers is in the cost side. It's complaining that the campus or requirements are too high. I do agree there's a likelihood that prudential issues are downplayed. Yeah, I don't think it did come up is I think there are potential conflicts of interest between prudential and conduct regulation. What I'd give you is after the financial crisis, all of our big banks are basically were basically facing huge fines. They're selling mortgage to particular. The fines were so large they were actually a threat. For attention between you, might be saying, Well, let's change the big arguments in favor of some people. And in terms of other things that didn't come up, this is a slightly controversial one, but I think there's like a reputational comes here as well. So conduct, you're always going to have conduct crises happening. And they will taint the, the reputation of whoever's job it is to do them. So some benefits of the central bank being outside of that and not being tainted with those. In terms of costs of twin peaks, the only one that really didn't come up potentially loading on a load of extra responsibilities for the central bank. If you worry, if you're one of these people that worry mandates are going too big, they're too big. Um, this kind of goes in that direction, so make it even bigger. So it's going to be the insurance regulation. Skip over this. I assume we'll share slides afterwards. Quotes from senior people in the UK at the time when we were essentially making the same points we, we heard. So let me how well is this actually done? Positive, but in the UK. I do agree with what Michael said, but it's not a panacea either. So I'll, I'll start with this little timeline chart. I'm not asking you to read what's on this. The message I want you to take from this is we've actually had quite a few things happen. Things like Brexit happened, or had a pension. We've had the, the first pandemic, but quite a few shots that have hit the field. Um, right. I'll show you some like economics looking graphs. Um, as I'm getting the presentation in terms of any technical materials. So, you know, if you put your economics hat on here and you say, like, how could we actually test whether this is working well or not? I want to look at some kind of empirical evidence. Firms doing better if they're regulated 
in a printed way than otherwise. So there is a paper that I found in the literature. I don't find it completely compelling for a reason I'll give you in a second. But this is a difference in difference study if that means anything to you. What they're exploiting here is that some firms would just be regulated by the ability group, the PRA, and other firms will be regulated really by um, thing. And the um, the idea is the fact that the blue line, the Twin Peaks firms, this is a measure of their systemic risk. The fact that it's kind of stabilized, whereas the, the FCA only firms, systemic risk has gone up a bit. That's like an idea that there's been some benefits of the Twin Peaks approach. I'm showing you this because it's an academic study, and I thought, you know, it's interesting. I don't find it entirely compelling because these firms are probably a little bit different. So I think it's a like for like study. I asked, I worked with my RA to do something a little bit like this. So I'll show you some evidence um, in the sort of direction. So the question we asked ourselves is, you know, there have been a bunch of shocks that have hit the global financial system. Is it true that UK banks' systemic risk, um, the systemic risk of Euro other European countries that have separate regulators, that feels like a testable hypothesis that you Twin you know, Peaks was really a universally better model. You kind of want to see it in the data, I think. So this is a chart of financial conditions. It's a US chart, but you'd get the same thing for any um, metric of global financial conditions. And the idea is like, if there are spikes in this chart, it's telling you there's a shock to the financial system, tightening in global financial conditions. So what I'm going to do is like look at a measure of systemic risk pre and post these spikes. And we'll compare UK banks to um, I think French, German, and Italian ones. Right, so the first one is the big shock that happened in, in the sample, and it's what happened after the COVID. Um, if, I guess the spread of COVID became apparent around the world back in March 2020. And actually, I've actually grouped together Netherlands and UK because they're both Twin Peaks models. So the red is Netherlands and the UK banks' systemic risk, and the blue is other big European countries. Okay? And I guess you'd look at this, you know, if you really stared, you'd say, well, actually, the UK systemic risk has been a bit lower. So this is kind of a tip in favour of Twin Peaks. It's kind of saying they fared better. They saw less of an increase in their systemic risk after this shock. And there's a few other cases that are like that. So. You could look at what happened after the Silicon Valley Bank failure in the United States in March of yeah, it was still this year. You can crack it time. Um, and the picture is very much the same. So UK and Dutch banks did slightly better than European banks in terms of what happened to their systemic risk measure. If you're interested in what the measure is, I can I can tell you afterwards. But I'm afraid it's not a super clean story. So you kind of get other other shocks, kind of push it in the other way. So this was after the Russo-Ukrainian war started, and it was a bigger deal for the UK and Netherlands banks, and then some of the other little peaks had a pretty inconclusive picture. So it's kind of depends, it's a bit in the eye of the beholder, I said. So finish then with um, just some thoughts on. Adding from here, I said this at the outset. So, like one big conclusion for me is, people are happy with how this regime has worked in the UK. Definitely, the view inside the Bank of England and the FCA, there's no clamour to work with them. So, I, I would say that is already a sign of success, given that it's been challenged over this period. Um, but I think there are some signs of this the structure beginning to kind of come under pressure. Maybe years after the financial crisis, um, people are, you know, the lobbying pressure from the financial industry is, is beginning to bite, so I'd say. So a few more charts. So these charts show you the um, number of times particular words are used within parliamentary debates in the UK. We have a, a database called Hansard that records all the speeches and 
how often the particular, are particular issues coming up. So the chart on the left shows you how many times has the phrase Twin Peaks been used in Parliament. Now, it's a very specific term. I'll, I'll grant you that. But basically, what you're seeing is there was a load of discussion about this. Don't look at the axes. It's not that funny. But there was a discussion of this up until the black line, which is when the, the Twin Peaks model was introduced. Or since then. So it kind of goes with the message that this just isn't an issue in Parliament right now. The chart on the right is the same thing, but for the frequency of, term, of the term financial regulation. And there, I mean, it depends a little bit on your eyesight and how you're viewing this chart. But for me, it's kind of, there was a load of discussion after the financial crisis to the left of the black line. Looks to me that that's picking up again right now, and that's that's my sense as well. There's a lot of discussion about um, are we regulating the financial system too hard? That why the economy is doing, doing badly. Are there benefits to leaving the European Union that can exploit? Not framed in in such explicit language, but that's what we mean. the two challenges. Um, I think these are challenges actually for the twin peaks model, but it would be for other models too. So first, um, a lot of the way this pressure in Parliament is manifesting itself is by adding additional um, objectives to the regulator, regulator's goals, which speaks to Andrew's very good point, that if you ask these regulators to do more and more, they're going to fail. And the thing that concerns me specifically is there's been an introduction of a competitiveness objective. In addition to making the banks safe and sound, we want you to kind of make sure that our peers, who you can probably all guess and understand. And, you know, those types of competitiveness to crises because it pushes into its weakening regulation. Second issue, which is it's more of a uniform issue, really, but it's um, what we're seeing in the United Kingdom is a big growth of the non-bank financial system. The banks are actually taking a less and less role in the financial system. It's still important, but more and more we're seeing markets, and by which I mean insurance companies, hedge funds, money markets, taking a bigger share of credit provision. And some of those guys are regulated by the Bank of England, but a lot of them are not. A lot of them are regulated by the FCA, the, the conduct regulator. And I see tensions between the FCA and the PRA in terms of strongly can we regulate these. So, yeah, thank you very much. Today. Now we have time for a few questions. Start there, Danielle. Thank you. Thank you all for the panel. Question on the line question. Optimal. Other first. Um, Oh, I can accept it, but up to my solution. Have a, a conduct of life. Point from Australia, but it's only
that's basically trying to, uh, to get it fixed. Look to the UK and make sure that you, you change it uh, twice. Uh, the structure, uh, it, it, it doesn't seem to. I, I think one, one, one question that. Coming from one to the other, that of the the one that we. Ah, one more question. Or? Take a few questions. Right, so. Thank you. Um, so, David, I think I'm going to draw on what we were discussing at lunch. That's right, Andrew. I'm going to go ahead and ask you to. So banks are, are, so your first line of argument was. When we're discussing regulation and we're looking at why are we looking at banks, right? Why do we need well they're incorporating systemic risk into their business? Model. And um so the first question I have is regarding systemic risk, which is right now we're seeing all throughout the world uh very drastic climatic uh, climate events. This naturally affects people's well beings and also affects a series of financial operations. And when you're thinking about guaranteeing financial operations, even straightforward traditional financial operations, not green bonds or anything of the sort, climate sort of factors into that. But then would climate then be something that should be looked at through a more of a prudential type, uh, where it would be addressed through a more systemic type risk, or should it be within a more um, guaranteeing quality or services or uh, to the consumers? Um, so that's my first question. And then 
the other question I have is sort of drawing on what Professor David said at towards the end. Um, could you think of even within the Twin Peak type setting? Could you think of a situation where market density and sophistication would factor into how um, how effective regulation is? So, for instance, here in Brazil, we have a very sophisticated financial market. Um, even though it is very sophisticated, it does lack, it has like severe, um, uh, especially towards competition, right? Um, it lacks specific regulation. So I was wondering how that factors into the, the Twin Peaks model. Thank you very much. Professor Yes, is Dr. Michael Taylor still there? Yes, I'm still here. Um, unfo unfortunately, I'm having a lot of trouble hearing the uh, conversation in the room and the questions. Um, oh. the, the sound has been very intermittent, so uh, I'm not sure whether I picked up all of that question. Um, let me see if I can answer it based on what I think I heard. And if I'm afraid, if I don't get the question quite right, um, maybe we can try again. Uh, I think as far as the first question is concerned, um, uh, I mean, I, I, it's not a binary choice. Um, it depends very much on whether or not a particular type of financial instrument or type of financial transaction has both systemic and consumer implications. And if it does, then inevitably, if you have two regulators, both of them will need to take a look at that particular uh, issue, um, which is one of the reasons why, as I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, the industry in the UK lobbied so hard against Twin Peaks because they saw it as unnecessary duplication. I think you can understand it from an industry point of view, but from a public policy point of view, uh, there are two very distinct objectives and you therefore um, there is an advantage if you have two groups of regulators looking at the same kind of instrument, but from a different perspective and, and from a different angle. So I think uh, this is where I, you know, you, um, proposals to adopt Twin Peaks structures often uh, come into difficulty because what you often hear is, okay, so where do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line? It's an argument that I've heard very many times in the past. And it, yes, it isn't all that easy to draw the line in, in some cases. But, you know, the fact is that we draw lines all the time in our everyday lives. And, you know, you, you just have to come up with some kind of pragmatic solution. So that I think that's, I hope that answers the first question. I think in terms of the second question, I mean, it, it really does depend on the structure of financial markets and how developed they are. Um, and the extent to which you have uh, both financial conglomerate groups and also uh, a system in which there is um, a, a very deep set of interconnections between different types of financial markets. And I think if you, you know, if the industry, if, if the, the nature of the financial services sector is such that you have those kind of interconnections and you have those kind of financial conglomerate groups, then it is certainly worth looking at a Twin Peaks type structure. Um, but as I emphasized in, in my comments, it's, it's not going to solve all of the regulatory problems. Uh, and I think, you know, one has to be realistic about that. And just to pick up on one of the points that David made in his presentation, unfortunately, again, I wasn't able to hear most of it, uh, but I, I could see the, the presentation slides. Um, and I think, you know, one point which I, I think is very important and which I would you know, put a lot of emphasis on is the fact that in the UK, there isn't really now much discussion around the future structure of regulation. It's, it's pretty much settled. And that is a very big contrast with the situation 30 or so years ago when I was first proposing the Twin Peaks model, where you know there was this tendency to you know, rip up the, the system by the roots and let's start all over again. And that happened on a number of occasions. I mean, well before the Financial, financial Services Authority was created, you know, we had something called the Financial Services Act, 
um, which set up a whole group of self-regulating organizations, which again got torn up and, you know, politicians just couldn't really decide on what the right structure was. So the fact that that now seems to be pretty settled in the UK, in my view, is a, is a fairly positive development. And it's something which, you you know, you could say, well, Twin Peaks has worked reasonably well in the UK, but uh, it isn't the solution for everyone. Um, and that's why it's important when you think about regulatory institutional reform you know, to look at the broader structure of financial institutions and markets and ask, does this make sense in this particular set of circumstances? Like to continue. Yeah. Is this working? Yes, excellent. So um, maybe I'll just address the other questions that came up. So um, the first one was around the cost of changing from one particular regulatory model to, uh, to another. Um, and I did see these costs, you know, manifest themselves in the UK when we when we went through this change. So I think there are kind of two types of costs. The first one is for the individuals who are working in the you know, the body you're about to abolish. A, that's kind of quite a negative signal for them, and B, they're suddenly going to find themselves working in one of two new organisations, right? And I think what happened in the UK, at least at the time, was um, the conduct authority was viewed as a less um, sophisticated or a less glamorous place to end up. That's probably not true now, partly because I think they pay more. Um, well, that's why they pay more. <laughs> Actually, I should, as an economist, I should have said that. Um, so I think that's one thing in terms of the, the kind of staff morale costs. There's also a direct cost in terms of um, a desire to change the culture within the old regulatory system and to turn the culture into a central bank, Bank of England one, which involved, I, I would say, a very positive thing, but it, it was nev nevertheless a costly thing of transferring staff from one area to another, you know, lots and lots of efforts to assimilate the, the um, you know, one half of the old body. So it's, it's these kind of costs. But I would kind of, I guess my big picture thing is these these are tiny, if you're thinking about a cost benefit analysis, these costs are small compared to the cost of getting getting your structure wrong and then suffering a financial crisis. Um, so I would say it's kind of still worth doing from a CBA point of view. Um, so maybe the climate question, that was a very interesting one. Um, and you asked, I think your question was, um, is this more of a prudential issue or more of a conduct issue? Yeah, it's a nice, nice question. I, I think it's actually both. And what, in the UK, we're seeing this. So the FCA, the conduct regulator, just about maybe last week, introduced some new rules about how you can, what sort of marketing you can put on an investment vehicle, a fund, if you're trying to sell it to consumers. So we have a load of funds, I'm sure you have some of them here, called sustainability funds. And there's a whole new set of rules that have come out. Saying you can only put the label sustainability on it if you've done X, Y, Z due diligence about the contents of the fund, what you know about their practices, and so on. So that's kind of in, an interesting positive development on the conduct side. And on the prudential side, the Bank of England has been quite active in terms of stress testing the UK banks against climate risks, getting to think about called scope three exposures of the, the customers they're lending to. Any to Mr. Christian first, I'd echo what, um, what David said. A lot of work in South Africa in the up to their establishment of a Twin Peaks regime. There were many occasions where people said to me, radio interviews and what have you, so how much is this going to cost? And, and how much more will this cost? My response was, in the first instance, when you talk about how much more this is going to cost, uh, 
I think it needs to be a degree of false comparison because not so much a case of you're going to be spending more than you were. It's a case of you weren't spending enough. It costs money to run a country. It's something Australians don't understand. If you want to run a country well, it's going to cost money. And added to which fact, costs, and I think I can give you a rough memory serves the additional cost to the South African government per year converted to Brazilian about a hundred million. Sounds like a lot. How much would it cost to recapitalize Put it in those terms, one of the cheapest investments you can make. Uh, Alvaro, I didn't actually hear your question. I, the, the, the acoustics in this room, I wonder if you could repeat your question in the phone's going to you. It's the question about sophistication. The more sophisticated a financial industry, the more likely you are to have holding companies. One of the innovations that FinTech creates is it doesn't just regulate financial health of the entire conglomerate group. Later, it becomes the, the better FinTech. Purpose. And secondly, the more sophisticated the products and the services, all you need specialized regulation, specialized in conduct and consumer protection. Then we can put comes into it. Be, and be numerous. Banks, banks like every other company, this, this, this ocean of capitalism, hidden home, of companies don't seek competition, they seek monopoly power. Play with competition. Banks don't worry about, given the choice, they won't worry about potential regulators' desire to you need a strong conduct regulator to go bad for society and let's talk
Australian Productivity Commission says that crazy four bank oligopoly. All of the productivity gains in your sector. Session is wonderful, but the time is over. <laughs> so I have to finish the session. Thank Professor Michael Taylor. Thank Professor Andrew Mullo, Professor Dave Eichmann. It has been a wonderful session. And hope uh, in the coffee break later on, <laughs> we can continue talking because right now we have a new session starting. So I would like to call here Joyce, if she's here, ah, yes, is going to uh, conduct this session. Keepers there. Yeah, like this, like this, like this. Enquanto eu espero aqui, gente, quem está aí, 
aqueles copinhos, é para encher de água e beber o tempo todo, viu? Em Brasília precisa disso. Tem muitos bebedouros aí com água filtrada e gelada, bem, tem um bem aqui do lado, tem um embaixo também. Então, não deixe isso, não deixe de usar isso aí. So I will I will call everybody to, to sit and pay attention, and I'll introduce you. Hello, hello, hello. We are starting session seven on empirical law and economics, uh, and we will start with the presentation of Yijia Liu from George Mason University. Um, so please go ahead. Oh, thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, so um, I lost my voice a week ago, so this doesn't really sound like me. But I uh, hope you can understand me. Thank you very much for coming. So this is a joint project with uh, Louis Kornhauser and uh, Stefan uh, Tonchu at, uh, at, at New York University. Uh, we've been writing on um, papers related to uh, the crowding out effect. So uh, first, I'm just going to introduce what the crowding out effect is uh, to those of you who may not be familiar with it. Uh, crowding out refers to a phenomenon uh, in which usually uh, under, under classical economics, right? Um, when you want to encourage people to do something desirable, or you think, you know, if you pay them, if you give them a reward, uh, that increases the cost of performing the uh, desirable activity, right? And that should increase in, in term in the quantity or the activity level uh, itself. Uh, similarly, uh, if you don't want some undesirable activity such as smoking, well, impose a fine to increase its cost and, and classical economics tell us that's I think everyone understands that. Uh, increase the cost, you reduce the action level. Um, <clears throat> the problem is uh, such uh, instruments uh, using money monetary uh, instruments, uh, which is 
prevalent really uh, in law and policy, it sometimes backfire. Uh, this is especially true if the activity has a social component to it. That is to say, the activity is not just benefiting uh, the person who's conducting it, but also people are benefiting or harming, right? It was externality, in other words. Uh, when it has this cross component uh, on society, um, sometimes uh, monetary instruments backfire. So we see, for example, in the latest COVID pandemic, um, you know, the uses of both types of inst uh, instruments, right? So getting uh, some states uh, give monetary rewards to encourage people to take up vaccination. That, uh, I think evidence quite clearly suggests that uh, that doesn't really work very well. Um, it doesn't really uh, lead to an increase in vaccination. Um, and we also see, uh, on the contrary, on the, uh, on the other side of the coin, uh, the use of fine in some jurisdictions that we to, uh, to punish those who uh, defy stay-at-home orders. Uh, so this is really a very relevant topic. Um, we see that really we see monetary instruments used everywhere, right? And and it's especially and given that it can backfire. That is to say, uh, its effect is not always predictable. It's not always clear. The question is. Why does it happen and how, how do we control it? How do we uh, understand better when it occurs? Why does it occur? What are the ways to undo it? So this is what uh, we've set out to do uh, in this project and also in our um, um, previous project. So let me just summarize very quickly what we did earlier. Um, so uh, uh, in my paper, we revealed, in our paper, we revealed a series of literature starting with Spinezi and Rusticini, the very famous uh, kindergarten pickup uh, paper, uh, when kindergartens imposed a fine on late arrivals to discourage parents from arriving late to pick up their kids, uh, happens a lot to me. Uh, uh, now I have much better understanding of the paper. Uh, it backfired, right? Uh, we, what we found was more parents decided to arrive late. Agnini and uh, Tunisi and Rusticini gave their paper a really wonderful title, A Fine is a Price. So it almost sounds like they've proven that these parents treated the fine as a price, right? A fine is imposed to prohibit certain activities, uh, but parents, uh, it is suggested by the, uh, the co-authors, uh, parents saw the fine as a price. A price is a market exchange, right? It's permissive. You go to a supermarket, you buy something, that's totally something that's allowed. It's a permission. You pay and you get it. So they suggested that parents perceive the fine as a price and as a result that led to more um, uh, more late arrivals. So this is why it's called crowding out, right? So parents had existing moral obligations to arrive on time. They knew that it was important. The teachers were waiting. Uh, but at the same time, when you post a prize, because it indicated some permission the authors uh, suggested, then it crowded out the monetary uh, incentive, crowded out the moral dimension of incentives. Uh, so as I mentioned, crowding out uh, have been replicated and studied in different policy settings uh, in the last three decades. Some papers found very strong crowding out effects. For example, there was a Norwegian hospital study uh, in which it was found that uh, if you offer patients who are ready to go home, uh, if you impose a fine on them for overstaying when they can actually go home and rest and recover, uh, more uh, patients actually decided to stay uh, longer in hospitals, presumably uh, more comfortable to be taken care of. But then you're also finding other policy settings, vaccination being one of them. Another is um, imposing a fine in plastic bag use. Well, I haven't had a plastic bag for many years. Let's put it this way. It works not just on me, but in aggregate gate as well. There's just no crowding out effect, right? The fine worked. It deterred people, uh, in the majority at least, from uh, using uh, plastic bags. So... Uh, um, and most recently, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Shahar, uh, and his team also uh, did a replication of the crowding out uh, paper by uh, Nizi and Rusticini online. They were not able to find the same effect. Um, parents arriving late to pick up uh, their children. So what we set out to do in our very first project 
was to, ex was to understand better why, uh, and also to examine the hypothesis or the su a suggestion made in Guizzi and Rusticini that, hey, this is really because parents are seeing a, a fine as a price. But this is really just one of the many possible explanations, another one being maybe it's a signal device, right? Uh, you know, imposing a fine is telling parents, hey, other parents are being late. So why not you, right? So if you have multiple explanations possible, we tested them and we found evidence for a fine as a price, the fine as a price hypothesis. We showed in particular through one treatment that when you made it very clear that it's not a price structure, that is to say the money you're paying is not going to the teachers, but going to the experimenter, then the crowding out effect vanished. So that was our first contribution in our previous work. The second one, which I think is actually more interesting, is we found out that a uh, social variable orientation score, which measures how uh, uh, how how social a subject is, that that is to say, how much a person cares about others uh, with respect to herself, it's a very well established uh, test um, and measures, uh, you know, so it gives participants pairs of choices, everything to yourself giving up $10 for yourself, but then the other side gets half of what you are getting, um, which one do you prefer, right? So uh, 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 32 pairs of uh, choices of, of what I just mentioned, you know, giving in a little bit uh, so that the other side gets a lot more um, or, you know, or, you know, or, or nothing at all. Um, that measures how much um, participants care about other people with respect to participants themselves we found that uh, the SVO score is a very strong predictor of uh, the uh, crowding out effect. So what this means is um, if you have a population that's very pro-social, that cares a lot about other people, then you're very likely to find a crowding out effect in your experiment or in your study. On the other hand, if you're, study, uh, if you're studying a predominantly selfish population, then you won't, and the price effect will work, work very well because they don't care about the uh, other people, uh, right? So this is what we've done, and, and this is our second study, which is uh, trying to answer the same question, right? Uh, well, could the activity itself be one of the reasons why sometimes crowding out uh, is observed? And, and the second thing we attempt to do is are there ways, are there cheap ways in particular that we can um, control the crowding out of that, right? It's, it's sometimes it's undesirable. Um, it's especially the case uh, when, uh, when policymakers uh, in, uh, give an award or a subsidy to encourage desirable activities. Why? Well, first of all, it doesn't work, right? The policy's aim is to increase desirable activities if there's crowding out. You get the opposite. You discourage it. Moreover, uh, if it's a reward or subsidy, well, you need to money has to come from somewhere, and we all know where it comes from from the people, right? So that's especially terrible. So it's really important to understand these processes. So without further ado, uh, I'm just going to describe very quickly our uh, study online and Turk. Not the best platform, but uh, we had to use it this time because of uh, because I was. We were having problems getting approval quickly enough uh, from our schools. Not moving. Oh, it's moving. Okay. So we start, we look at these different uh, activities with a social component. We realize that first of all, uh, there is a key division, which is some activities such as vaccination has both a social component and also a private component. Right? I mean, it's good for you. It's also good for others. It also protects other people. So this is what we call mixed activities. And, uh, and COVID is especially interesting. Uh, when I presented this paper two months ago, I got criticized, right? I mean, one of uh, my uh, commentators said, you know, I would just remove COVID because it's so politicized. There's so many different reasons driving people's decisions, whether, you know, uh, politics being one of them, whether or not you believe it actually works is another. Um, all sorts of things, right? And, um, and, and, and so, I, so, and I argue that actually this is what makes it interesting and I'll explain why. Uh, and, 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 uh, so the first thing we looked at is an, a mixed activity, 
which is COVID-19 booster, right? So because it's mixed, it's a, it has this component. It also has this social component. The private component, uh, we hypothesize, is more likely to be influenced by the classical economic theory, right? Increase the cost, decrease the activity. The social component, of course, is uh, more likely to be subject uh, to uh, crowding out. Uh, the second type of activity is what we call purely pro-social activity. These activities don't really benefit you directly. I mean, you know, you go and donate your blood. You, perhaps you feel good, but it doesn't really benefit you directly unless you enjoy the time you spend sitting there, which is rare, right? So uh, donating blood is most likely going to benefit uh, other people. So this is, we classify that and the purely uh, pro-social activity, or maybe, you know, um, dominantly pro-social activity, if you'd like. Um, we opt for plasma instead of blood because in some states in the U.S., uh, you can't pay for blood, right? But, uh, but payment for plasma is a lot. So we didn't, we didn't want our participants to uh, worry about that, uh, to introduce any kind of factors that go beyond the scope of the study, so we went for plasma. Now, we introduced one further uh, manipulation, one further context, which is organ donation, right? Organ donor registration. Uh, we go for this because there's, a, um, there's always this debate in uh, the philosophy of law as well, which is why are certain things, uh, why are certain things not tradable on the market? Uh, what is so inalienable when it comes to organ. And, and we want to see if it can be reflected in this setting as well. Uh, so, uh, and we, 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 we were making different guesses as well. We thought this one, maybe we'll see some crowding out, but maybe persuading people to crowd back in would be harder. And that's, that's actually what we found initially, but uh, because we had to clean our data, MTurk is horrible, uh, the significance dropped out. So we're still working on the project. We're not done. We're trying to get more money uh, for all for anyone who's done experiments. You know, money really uh, uh, run uh, run out quickly. So we're trying to get some funding to do more. So this is more like a study so far. Those three settings, and here's the um, oh, here's the um, so here's the uh, design of the, of the experiment on Mter. So we do a pre-screening. In step one, uh, so that allows us to kick out data that are not very uh, of, of good quality. Uh, for those of you who have played with MTurk, there's always this worry that bots are answering questions, right? So we're voting a lot of questions to check on consistencies. So we threw out a lot of uh, answers uh, based on the pre-screening test uh, for that reason alone. Uh, we also screen people for their, pre, uh, for their social value orientation score. Uh, so that we can concentrate, we can focus on the pro-social groups, the types from uh, based on our first study are most likely to respond to, uh, uh, to the most likely to, sh to show the crowding out effect, right? So um, we also tested them on their uh, private COVID concerns. We asked them, do you think you're vulnerable? Are you living with people who are vulnerable to COVID-19? Uh, so a series of questions. And the third dimension is their political inclination, which we haven't analyzed yet at this stage. Um, uh, the, so COVID concerns, thank you. Uh, COVID concerns and political inclinations are the two factors that are very likely to influence a person's choice when it comes to COVID vaccination, right? The private component. So we're hoping that we can use these two to tease out the private component. Uh, so initially what we did was okay, uh, we assigned the pro-social types to, uh, to three treatments. But then uh, just to test our hypothesis, we also eventually uh, sent a, an equal number of uh, pro-self types uh, to two of the three treatments. So I'm gonna present, uh, I'm gonna show you what it looks like. Uh, in greater detail, three treatments, right? The first one is no, the second one is we're paying you money. This is really creating the crowding out effect. The amount of money paid is different for the three activities, uh, $125 for vaccination, 7.5 for uh, blood plasma donation, 
and $250 for organ uh, donation, uh, registration, in fact. So this is not you're donating your organ. This is just registering to be a donor. So if you accidentally die in an accident, um, we know that you've agreed to uh, donate your organ. And the third treatment is the framing effect. This is the, the solution we hypothesized that might work to undo the crowding out effect, to crowd it back in, as we would say. So this is a cheap way to do it. We anticipated that maybe we can just make it very clear to participants that, hey, we're not paying for, we're not buying your plasma, we're not buying you to get vaccination. We're rewarding you, we're thanking you, we're trying to compensate you to do something good. Um, and the way we do it is we emphasize the appreciation, the reward frame. We also uh, tell them that we match their kind act with uh, a donation of about 25% of the value of the reward that is being given to the participants, right? The question is, this is a very simple solution in the sense that, that it doesn't cost the state or um, additional money. It's the same amount of money, right? $125, $100 in reward and $25 in match donation for COVID-19 uh, booster intake, for example. Um, and, and we want to see if that simple solution alone can avoid the crowding out effect. So uh, here's uh, a focus on just the very first context. Um, we uh, show participants some general information uh, of COVID-19 booster. Uh, uh, and our treatment one says, well, you've read the information about would you like to get uh, vaccinated? Yes, no, and, and the option C and D for those who have already done it. We ask them to imagine if uh, at this very moment, would you make the same choice or not, right? So we don't want to leave out uh, those participants who already did it and who might have changed their mind, for, for example. It's rare, but we did have a few who changed their mind. Now, the next treatment is the payment treatment, right? So uh, California is now paying you money incentives to motivate you to receive the latest booster vaccine. So uh, in consideration of the information, would you get it for $125? And finally, this is the framing treatment. This is the uh, solution that we're testing, uh, with rewarding you $100 uh, for, uh, and uh, we want to appreciate, we appreciate you for, um, you can see, uh, we deeply appreciate you for staying up to date to protect other people. Um, we are matching your uh, community-minded action by contributing uh, $25 on your behalf. In other words, making it very clear that uh, this is uh, uh, this is for the benefit of society, right? Not paying you money to do it. Um, so, if you look at this, um, so for the uh, sorry, oh, oops, uh, for the mixed activity. Indeed, you see uh, for vaccination, uh, you see no statistically significant difference in terms of the yeses you get. So by the way, I'm presenting the collapsed yeses. C and D are merged into the yes and no's. Uh, in the appendix, I do have uh, data on just A and B. There's no difference in terms of the outcome. So you don't really see any statistical significance here. Uh, in terms of crowding out. And of course, if there's no crowding out, there's not really any crowding back in, even though you see a slight increase, it's not uh, statistically significant. Uh, for plasma donation, uh, which is the classical example, you see very strong crowding out, right? Giving you money to the pro-social types. Um, so 67% uh, uh, yes, decrease to only 55%, 20% decrease in the people who are willing to uh, donate or to, or to give their plasma if an, a monetary treatment uh, is introduced. And now we then have the crowding in effect, right? The framing, uh, telling them, hey, we're not paying you, we're not buying your blood or plasma. We're rewarding you for doing something good. And you see that it bounces back to 73%. And uh, both effects are significant. Uh, as a significant uh, for organ registration as an organ donate, a donor, though uh, you uh, receive very weak effects, right? So there is a slight decrease uh, and there is a slight increase with the uh, crowding in effect, 
uh, but the decrease and the increase are not statistically significant. So at least the, the effect seems to be very much, much weaker when it comes to organ uh, donation registration. So here's the uh, regression backing up uh, what we uh, what I just said. Um, now, I think what is the most interesting for us in, uh, as a next step is to look at uh, two things, right? One is to understand why the effect is so weak for organ donation. So we're trying to collect, uh, getting more money to collect more data to see if it's a problem of N, right? And one thing we have to understand is we're trying to flip people on the margin, right? So it's not it's not like everyone's going to respond to it. Uh, there are people who are more hesitant on the margin. We're trying to see if we can persuade these people on the margin to change their mind. And maybe there's just more people on the margin for plasma donation than there are for organ donation, right? And that's one of the reasons uh, we say that organ uh, donation or giving up an organ uh, to a lot of people sounds like something completely different. We we did, we did have a follow up study trying to understand what is going on in their mind. Is it because they don't want to? Uh, they don't like to think about death. Uh, is it because um, this is something that occurs after they die? Uh, it's always difficult to think about what happens after our death, right? Or is it because we want to die with our complete body? Religious views, for instance, found out that religion is very. Uh, rare choice among the participants. Um, uh, the other question, which is more interesting to us, is the mixed effect, right? Can we show that um, uh, through the use of uh, their uh, COVID attitude and also uh, their political inclination, can we tease it out? Um, it's, so far, there's, we found something, but it's not very satisfactory, let me put it this way, right? So we introduced COVID is uh, the, uh, the the average answer uh, the participants have to those COVID uh, questions, uh, the smaller the COVID, uh, uh, COVID is, uh, the less they care about it. The greater COVID is, the more they care about COVID for themselves and their families. So we uh, introduced these cross terms. Sorry, I didn't, uh, it should be uh, times, right? Not a uh, uh, lower bar. Uh, so these are cross terms and we see that indeed, uh, when you introduce these cross terms, we get some effects, but uh, we're more interested in its effects on T1. So by the way, I, I forgot to mention one thing, which is the baseline in our regression is the crowded out baseline treatment too. So because we're trying to see if there's crowding out, this is comparing T1 to T2. We're trying to see if there is crowding in, this is comparing T2 to T3. What we did is uh, for those regressions, we have T2 as a baseline, and we look at T1 and T3. Right, so we were hoping to see some significance uh, for T1. Uh, this is the crowding out effect, right? Uh, but instead, what we found is is the T3 effect becomes prominent. We don't really see the T1 effect. Uh, we still need to look at the political inclination data. Hopefully, that will bring some effects. Uh, but our explanation so far for this is it seems that framing brings to people's attention that things they might not have paid attention to before, right? So right, uh, raising concerns for the social types, that's probably the best explanation we have so far. Uh, the results still uh, continue to puzzle us, uh, but hopefully in the next version, we'll have better explanations after we bring in uh, political inclinations. Maybe that explains it even better. The COVID attitude definitely has important um, uh, explan uh, ex uh, explanatory in this study. So with this, uh, I think I'm out of time. So let me wrap up. Um, so we're still trying to understand why uh, uh, why these uh, activities would have different results, right? Um, uh, um, but we, I think, as a as a as a at a first stage, trying to understand whether the activity has a private component is in trying to understand, as I mentioned. The margin that we're trying to flip, uh, flip is important. In our future study, we'll also put this on a, a Likert scale. Now, right now it's binary. I think that's a mistake we made in our uh, original design, but this is a study where we're, we're going to use a scale and we are also going to randomize the three choices, right? This is a pilot, so we didn't do that. Obviously, uh, we shouldn't present them in order, right? We should just randomize that. that these are the two things that uh, we'll definitely work on. Uh, in future studies. Uh, with that, I conclude. Thank you very much. I look forward to your uh, questions.
thank you very much. We're running late on time because of all the other sessions we still have. We're going to leave the questions to the end. So we are going to go ahead and already go with Benjamin Tabak from Getulio Vargas. Thank you for the opportunity to present the paper here. I'm Clarice and I'm in working on cognitive biases and behavior economics and applied instruction. Can you hear me now? Better? Okay. A couple of weeks ago, I was teaching at the National and Annual Meeting of the Administration of Justice in Brazil. Question How can we improve justice administration? And one of the issues that we are discussing here is how can we use judicial decision making? This paper, what we do is that we look at the decisions made by judges and like examples and how this cognitive bias appears in some of these examples. We make a case in a paper in which there uh, there's a lot of room for cognitive bias uh, in 